most people in this world are naive, like I was when I entered the work world. All of my clients' greatest pain was the lie they told themselves. What would you say healing is? All healing comes from inside ourselves, and all healing is based on love. The most successful people in the world are the people that can self-soothe. They are good decision makers. They are hyper resilient. They don't stop at failure. The past is actually a representation of who I am now, rather than who I am now is a representation of my past. I want to write this down because yeah. I feel like that just yeah. blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you are very pleasant and you have a profound experience of life, you have a right to do nothing. Absolutely not. I could, I could sit here and cry and tell you all kinds of tragic stories about how I outshone the master and how miserable it made me, right? So I was one of those people who was a bit naive and didn't understand this kind of secret language that power, that people in power have, right? So a lot of the book is opening it up this world to everyone, right? It used to be only white men of a certain age and a certain ba social background who had access to this kind of knowledge who could have that kind of power. And it kind of pissed me off that it was like the secret that nobody wanted to share. I wanted to open up, I wanted to get end all the hypocrisy. I wanted everybody to see that this is how things operate behind closed doors, etc. So I wrote the book to kind of reveal these secrets, right? The book is really not, I'm not trying to instruct the sharks out there and try to make people more manipulative. I'm trying to make you less naive in your life. And that was sort of the purpose behind the book. And since that's the spirit I wrote it in, it's interesting to see that that's the spirit that most people take it in. I get a lot of emails from readers and most of the emails are, God, you opened my eyes up to something I never really thought about. This has really changed how I look at people and look at the world. It doesn't make me paranoid, it just makes me more aware of myself and what other people are up to. So that was sort of the motivation behind the book. It's helpful to hear because I think that that probably mirrors my experience quite a bit with the book. I, you know, when you read the, the title, you maybe get an impression and, and try to figure out like, you know, what is this book actually helping me do? But then as I picked up the book and started to read it, I probably put myself in that naive camp as well. And so it felt like this is really helping me decode something that I know has been happening, but I haven't really known how to understand what's been happening. When I was digging into the, the laws of human nature, you bring up terms like narcissism and, and you know, those who would feel like, ah, that's a term that's outside of me. I don't, I don't connect with that. That's not me, that's somebody else. And this idea of get over yourself. I mean, all of us are on that spectrum. All of us have this connection, this innate drive. And when you can embrace that, you can understand it. But when you hold yourself away from it, it feels like it's, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of have this facade on the world or kind of see the world like it's outside of you. Was that a big important piece of the, of the book? Very much so. So the basic, the most elemental law of human nature is that we deny that we have it, right? It's always the other people. I, oh, I'm not a narcissist. I'm not aggressive. Oh, I don't have a dark side. No, I'm, I'm not irrational. No, no, none of those things, right? So we want to deny it. But it's so insanely irrational. We all come from the same origins. We can trace it back. They've done it genetically to like one woman the source of Homo sapiens, like hundreds of thousands of years ago, were all cut from the same cloth. No matter our culture, no matter our gender, no matter any our period in history, we all have the same genetic components. We are all developed, went through the same evolutionary process, the same brains wired in the same way. So if some people are deep, what I call deep narcissists, no doubt, and they're, they're toxic and they're difficult, but if, one, if some people have that, how is it that other people don't have any of it? That's not possible. There must be something within all of us that would make us all prone to becoming deep narcissists. But some people, it, trigger, it makes them fall into that deepness. Others, we're able to save ourselves, right? But if aggression is something that's built into human nature, and I try and go through it, the, the whole history of it, right? So you're wanting to exclude yourself so, I mean, I get, I, 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 people have posted um, comments on YouTube about my ranting about narcissism. They, they go, well, Robert, you're, you're a snake oil salesman. That's absolutely ridiculous. I'm not a narcissist. You know, 0.5% of people are known to be narcissists. I can bet you 
that the person saying that is a narcissist, right? Because the fact that you want to deny that you have this quality is a, sign, is a, sen, a, a sure sign that you have it. That you're in denial. That you're trying to shine a great light on yourself. Look, I'm superior. I'm the one person in the world on this planet that doesn't have it. Man, you're a narcissist, right? That is a sure sign of it. I, I feel like you, you can detect from signs in, in a person's face whether they're sincere or not, or what's really going on behind the, behind the mask that they're wearing. And I wrote about that in The Laws of Human Nature. We have that ability because so much of human communication is nonverbal. It's a skill that was developed over hundreds of thousands of years by our ancestors before language is invented, reading the thoughts of other people so we could get along before we could express things in words. We are masters at those picking up those signals. You're just not paying attention. You're not learning it. But it's hard for the face to lie, right? It's even harder for the voice to lie. The voice is the last thing that you can use to lie. I know I had my Irish accent, but if somebody really saw through it, they would see kind of the bullshit that was going on. And, and so it's hard to train the face when you don't really feel joy. When you say you got a promotion and I'm kind of secretly, going, oh shit, Tyler's doing better than me in life, damn. Yeah, that's great, Tyler. Oh, that's wonderful. Congratulations. The, the kind of tightness there is just revealing that I'm, oh, shit, he's doing better than I am kind of thing, right? Whereas, wow, Tyler, that's fantastic. I'm really happy for you. There's a different look in the face. I just didn't do a good job right there, but it's a different look in the face, right? It's spontaneous, the face lights up. You can detect that from a mile, million miles away, the difference, you're just not paying attention, right? The tone of voice when you're nervous and cramped and the throat kind of closes up is a sign of discomfort, of anxiety, of fear, of even panic. So somebody could be trying to say something full of bluster and confidence, but if their voice is kind of tightening up, it's the, they're feeling the opposite. The voice is very, very hard to lie. The posture, when somebody is talking to you, but their feet are pointing in a different direction, they're not really, they're wanting to get away from you, right? You know, how much the eyes engage, whether they're relaxed or slouching. Their sense of power and leadership is all in the body. This is insane language. And great books have been written far greater than my own book. I just wrote a chapter on it about this language of nonverbal behavior, right? Posture, voice, facial expression, etc., cetera, and, and actions. So actions are a language that you're not paying attention to. When someone is continually late for an appointment or continually late in delivering work that they're supposed to deliver, that's a sign of passive aggression. That's a sign of some kind of character flaw. And if they do it once, they'll probably do it a second time. If they do it a second time, something's going on, right? If their desk is all messy, etc., these are signs of something going on internally. Pay attention to all of these details and it will really help you in life. All of my clients' greatest pain was the lie they told themselves. Your mind has no choice. The strongest force in all of us is we must act in a way that matches how we define ourselves. So your mind's job is to make your thoughts real. The job of your mind is to listen to your thoughts and to start to make them real. And it doesn't have any choice in that, but you have a great choice, your job is to think better thoughts, which makes your mind's job easier. You were thinking, I, I don't, I'm not gonna succeed. Everything's not gonna work out. If, if I start that business, it will fail. If I write the essay, it will get a bad mark. So I'm just gonna procrastinate here. You know, procrastination and self-sabotage is nothing more than a reaction to a thought that I'm not enough. Is that really the basis of RTT to, to rapid transformational therapy to have people change their their narrative, whether they do it on their own or they do it through a therapist? What's the basis of? of well, the I think for all most of us, we make a belief without realizing that that belief turns around and makes us. And then we have something called confirmation bias. We now look for proof that that belief is real. So that I can me. have a belief. I'm painfully shy and I can't speak to people. I've made a belief, but that belief is making me now because. 
I stress about speaking to people, I might blush, I avoid situations, and now I'm looking for proof, the confirmation bias. Look, last time I spoke, I went bright red, I got all tongue-tied, that person, I could see they weren't interested, I felt like an idiot, so I better make sure I carry on not speaking. So you have to switch it. I've, I've made a belief, why don't I change that to, I can talk to people, other people do it, I have two ears and one mouth, that means I should listen more, talk less, but I can engage with people. If I can talk to my friends or my pet or someone, I, I can talk to people. I'm, I'm making a different belief. And that different belief is making me, now I'm looking for confirmation bias of how, oh, I spoke to a guy in the store and they were engaging. I spoke to someone at a bus stop and they were engaging. And if I can speak to one person, I can speak to many and I can learn. I can go on YouTube and just learn what makes a great speaker. So listen, if you're prepared to tell yourself a lie, which is if I look at cake, I gain weight. Everything I touch falls apart. No one in my family has ever done anything. I've got the depression gene. We don't even know if that's true. That's probably a lie. When the people say, I, I, I've eaten like a horse all weekend. No, you haven't. You didn't have a nose bag on. I'm assuming you, were, you peed occasionally, so you didn't really eat nonstop like a horse all weekend. Let's change that. So if your lies are, I gain weight by looking at food, you might as well say, I got a super fast metabolism. My body is a fat burning machine. Is that true? But it doesn't matter because saying you eat like a horse is also not true. But here's how it works. You got a belief. You've made it, it's making you, and you're looking for proofs and make a better belief. When people say, oh, I got a memory like a sieve, why not say I have an amazing memory? I can't sleep at night, sleep comes to me. Changing the first bit, the thought, means that you change the feeling, means that you change the behavior. And people say, no, it's amazing, I just thought a different thought, and everything changed on a dime. So your mind's job, is to make your thoughts real. The job of your mind is to listen to your thoughts and to start to make them real. And it doesn't have any choice in that, but you have a great choice. Your job is to think better thoughts, which makes your mind's job easier. So when you understand your mind's job and you understand your job, so let's imagine you're saying to your mind, if I get dumped one more time, it will kill me. If one more person ghosts me, that's it. It will ruin my life. If one more person rejects me, I'm just gonna never go out again. Now your mind's job is to make you act in a way that avoids rejection, probably by becoming very solitary, not asking for anything. But if you were to say to your mind, hey mind, you know, I, 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 I love connecting. I'm finding love and love is finding me, your mind's going to do a different job. If you say to your mind, oh, what I would give for a week in bed, I just want to lie around doing nothing, your mind's like, well, i got to act on that. You're thinking a thought, I need some time off, I need to lie around on the couch doing nothing. And now your mind can give you the flu or chronic diarrhea because it's listening to a thought which it must start to make real. But if you would just think a better thought, so if I said to my mind, I want attention, I'm lacking intention, I need to be noticed, I might get chronic diarrhea or explosive gas or a nervous twitch, I'll definitely get attention. But if I just say to my mind, a better thought, I'm worthy of attention, good attention, and I get good attention because I'm good at my job and my boss notices and people notice, then everything changes on a dime because we have to remember something. The mind has no choice but to act on our thoughts. But we have an incredible choice to think better thoughts. And if you could look in your body and see the inflammation, the stress hormones, the cortisol you create from thinking negative thoughts, you would never do it again. So we got to remember our thoughts are not our thoughts. They're a blueprint that our mind, body, and psyche are trying to make real and if you could only think better thoughts, you'd give your mind an easy job. I think that's gonna resonate with so many people. I think about our channels and some of the, the things that people are working through and just hearing it said so clearly, your mind's job is to turn your thoughts into reality. Yeah. And it's got no choice in that. No choice. But you've got the ability to change those thoughts. Yeah. That, that essentially feeds the machine. Yeah. 
I, you know, when people think icons, oftentimes they think, you know, Hall of Fame athlete, movie star. We think people who have transformed an industry, which is you. Um, so, you know, after doing a bit of a bunch of research into your, your story, what you've done, I understand the work you've had, the impact you've had on the world. How about your own story? Do you ever feel like your the narrative in your head needs to be worked on? Like, how, how does this impact you? You're, you're a person just like all of us. Do you ever need to offer self-treatment to yourself? Yeah, you know, a couple of months ago, I was lying on the sofa and heard myself say I'm chronically tired. And I thought, but that's not true. You are tired and you need some rest and some water, but you're not chronically tired. So I'm still aware that occasionally you have to take, this is driving me crazy. What am I talking about? I'm talking about being at the airport and my flight is delayed by seven hours, which happened recently, but hey, I've got a laptop, I'm in the lounge, I can get lots of work done. And so I do occasionally have to check myself and take out the words chronic, this is chronic stress. Well, I don't say that, I said chronic tiredness. This is driving me insane. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a delay at an airport. Does it really matter? I'm talking about I've got all this workload on, but I can just cancel it. It's really not that important. You know, I, you say that with it, my kid is driving me crazy, but they're not. They're an age appropriate baby. And in a blink of an eye, they'll be gone. It, it goes so fast. And then you'll think, oh, you know, all that time I spent getting stressed about my kid doesn't put, do up lids. They get peanut butter smears on the fridge. They, they leave mess everywhere. Now here I am, well, and I'd give anything to have those kids back smearing peanut butter on my lovely stainless steel fridge. So I think what helps me a lot and helps many of my clients is to do this. This challenge I have now, because I try not to say problem, is it someone else's fantasy dream? Would they love a husband who leaves his underpants on the floor? A kid who never shuts, I go in and every cabinet door is open. A kid who doesn't understand that laundry goes in the basket. Is there someone in the world who goes, oh, I would love that problem. I'm just about to spend all my money on IVF. I've just mortgaged my home for IVF. I give anything for a messy husband or a messy wife. And so that really helps you to think, wow, is my problem someone's fantasy dream come true? And also I learned maybe 30 years ago to change my story. You know, my story was interesting. My mother, when I was pregnant, told me that when she was pregnant, she was having an affair with my father's best friend and that she really wanted me to be his baby. When I was born, she was so upset. She turned her face to the wall. She, cr she, she cried for a year because I was the wrong baby. She didn't tell me that till I was having my own baby because she was telling me, you know, she said, you cried for two years because you must have picked up my disappointment that you were the wrong baby. I wanted a piece of this guy. I couldn't marry him, but I want, and you weren't his. And I was so upset and for a while I felt this tremendous sense of shame I was the wrong baby and my mother in the 60s was having an affair with someone else but then later I thought wow I could reframe that because my mother told me that both men were in the maternity ward when I was being born they both picked a name for me he picked the name Candy and for a I would never recognize that name I hated that name and Marissa was a kind of a weird name when every kid at school is called Jana and Sarah and Claire and Pamela and here was I Marissa but later I thought Gee, that's actually really cool if two men wanted me when I was being born I should have known that when I was 20 I wouldn't have dated all those idiots I'm going hey no 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 when I was being born two guys wanted me two guys were waiting for me to be theirs and they both picked a name so I switched the shame and the embarrassment to, it's actually kind of cool. But that's the thing, you get to edit your story, upgrade your story, rewrite your story, change your story. You know, people say, but I was abused when I was a kid. How can I edit that? Well, that's a horrible, horrible thing. So people might say to me, but that's easy for you. I was abused when I was a baby. I was physically abused, sexually, mentally abused. How can I reframe that? Well. I would never diminish how horrific that is, but you're an adult now. You don't live with those people. You have the power to make better choices, to say, no one's putting their hands on me. I will never do that again. And so our job is to look at our story and think, well, 
if I retell this story every day, am I keeping it going? Why don't I change it? Because you do have the power, should you want to, to edit your story, rewrite it and change it. What would you say healing is? All healing comes from inside ourselves. We have the physician on the outside and the physician on the inside. All healing comes from within us and all healing is based on love. That's the center of, of, of holistic healing. Love is the center? Yes. I've heard that you have a, a mantra, and I'm, I'm curious about this, that never give up. How have you used that mantra in your life? Well, it started with um, my dad. And I remember being probably nine years old, and I was doing something, and I said, oh, I give up. And he looks at me and he says, are you a quitter? And I thought, oh man, that's like being a liar. No, no, I'm not a quitter. And if I, uh, you know, look back, there's Satan's, it's so imp important for us to understand what we teach our children. And these are things that were really um, brought to me so that I could understand the kind of life that I was gonna actually live. And so, yeah, I, I, I had to make do, I had to let go, I had to, uh, my mother taught me how to not take things in and, and say that was horrible, I hurt my feelings, and I could just let it go. And oh, 15, 20 years ago, I came up with a, a for myself, a kind of a structure for philosophy that I was building and all. I've come up with what I call five L's. The first one is life and love. Without life, there's nothing, you know. You can be a, a seed in the Great Pyramid for 5,000 years and no, nothing happens until love, which is light and water and so on, softens the shell and the light and the seed opens up and it grows. Life and love are one unit. They work together. They, it's like a pregnancy. The, uh, when, the, when a mother is pregnant, she and that baby are one unit. They, what she eats, the baby eats. What she thinks, the baby thinks. It's a constant process. But that, that aspect of reality that is that baby that is being nurtured and, and grown within the womb doesn't really find its own identity until it takes its first breath. And then it becomes who it is. It takes, it takes the reason why it's coming into this earth. So it's this reality that life and love are un one unit and that as we work with us, each other that way, we can really understand aspects of ourselves but aspects of, of the world around us and as, aspects of other people too. The first L was life and love. And those, so those two came together and I understood those. But the third one was laughter. Laughter without love is cruel. It's mean. It, it takes families apart. It, it has caused wars, you know. Laughter can be cruel. But laughter with love is joy and happiness. And the, third, the fourth L is labor. Labor without love, love is drudgery. It's, it's, you just gotta go to work. You just gotta do this. You know, too many diapers. It's just, and, and, but labor with love is bliss. It's why you, we singers sing, why painters paint. It's why I do what I do. It's why you do what you do. It's what makes our heart sing. It's that inner aspect of our being that is, comes alive and, and we'll work 
five times as hard as we were when we were dragging ourselves along with the drudgery thing. And the fifth one is listening. Listening without love is empty sound. It just doesn't make any sense and you don't understand. But listening with love is understanding. So these five loves, uh, I mean these five L's, uh, have been very helpful for me in structuring and understanding the, the philosophy and the lives that I'm working with. Because I think for most of us, that would be what we want, but we get stuck with something. What do you think we're getting stuck with when we're trying to embrace living medicine? Because we really don't understand our own power. See, I have this kind of idea that when God created this earth, whoever God is to whoever you are, is it was it was he created the earth and it was beautiful and everything was in place and what, the way it should be. But then he created the human being and he said to us, now you are the only creatures on this whole place that have the right to choose and have free will. So therefore, I give you dominion over the earth. And we, being who we were, decided that what he meant by dominion was dominance. And so we've taken over the earth and done what we darn well choose with it. And look where we are. So it's that reality that within us as human beings, I think that like E.T. who was reaching for home, I think that in the inner part of us, we're all reaching for our true humanity. Hmm. And that true humanity understands that we are the ones who do the healing. When you mentioned that at the center of holistic medicine or, or living medicine is love, and you describe these, these five L's, living, love, laughter, labor, and listening, and you kept relating it back to love. It really does feel like at the center of this philosophy is love. Yes, yes, it, it really is. It, it feels like that's what you've shared your whole career, beautiful and radical ideas, this, this notion that medicine could be flipped from killing to living, that we could put love in the center of it and we could recognize that the healing comes from the inside. I think these messages are just transcendent. And not be afraid of love. You know, uh, it, it's, it's the very essence of our being. And if we can accept it and share it and not try to, you know, you can't save it. It's, it's an energy. You don't save energy. You have to use it. If you don't use it, it dies. It was a very dark period of my life. And it was realizing what I now call the only belief that matters, what Carol Dweck calls the growth mindset, which is, that if I put time and energy into getting better at something, I will actually get better at that thing. And so just realizing, whoa, I could put time and energy into this thing and I will actually improve over time. And so that perspective shift will change everything in your life because now it's about skill acquisition. But the real breakthrough moment was realizing that what I built my self-esteem around mattered. And so I had been building my self-esteem around being right, being smart, and being worthy, and that was holding me back. Before Quest started, you were in a dark place in your life for a period. And so all of this stuff about mindset existed back then too, but maybe you weren't able to embrace it the way you are now. Where were you at then, and what flipped the switch? I talked earlier about the, you have this thing called the psychological immune system. And the psychological immune system is gonna give you reasons why that failure is not your fault. And the bad thing is that it focuses you outward, right? Like, oh, it's their fault, they did this, they're holding me back, the world doesn't want me to succeed, whatever. Uh, the good thing is it actually stops you from beating yourself up too much. And so if you can learn that, oh, wait a second, I need to value myself for something, but that something does not need to be being right. And so instead, if I switch it, to I'm gonna build my self-esteem around identifying the right answer, now all of a sudden you actually can have a growth mindset. You can be focused on 
getting better and improving and just learning because when you realize that you've made a mistake, it's actually exhilarating because you're like, whoa, I can run the physics of progress. I can get better at this thing and make this incremental improvement. And so that was life changing for me. And so, of course, it wasn't like, oh, line in the sand, my life was bad, now my life is good. But it was line in the sand, I'm not making progress, now I'm making progress. And so that day really did, and I remember the whole debate that I had with myself, uh, that day was like, oh, this is like the first day of the rest of my life. I'm no longer gonna value myself for being good, smart, right, worthy. I'm gonna value myself entirely for being willing to stare nakedly at my inadequacies figuring out what I need to get good at, no bullshit, what would it take to achieve my goals? And then I'm just gonna do that. And I'm gonna do it knowing that success cannot be guaranteed. So I have to find a way to love this even if I were failing. And that becomes the magic cocktail. It doesn't mean that you ever stop wanting to win. Like I'm still very much motivated to win, but I'm not devastated when I lose and I'm optimizing for the struggle. So in the struggle, when I'm not sure if I'm gonna win or lose yet, I'm still having fun. I mean, all of that sounds super logical, right? But so many people are caught, like not at the logic part, but at the emotional part where it's like, my brain gets this, but something's happening inside of me that I'm just feeling like I'm at arm's length from what I'm trying to achieve. So how did you go from like, and maybe you weren't there, but you know, emotional, because I think that a lot of people are, are listening to this thinking, cool, I want to achieve my dream. Maybe it's not happening as fast as I wanted to. I'm in an emotional spiral. How do you go from emotion to logic where now it feels like there's a pathway out here? Don't, don't try to get out of emotion. Stay in it, live with it. I love it. Just recognize that you're having a biological experience. Nature has hardwired your brain in a certain way and not all of those emotions are useful. The problem is people think if they feel it, then they need to embody it and they need to act it out. I am highly skeptical of my emotions. So if I feel angry, I'm like, mm, should I be angry? Like, is this gonna be useful? And so I have a rule in my life. I only do and believe that which moves me towards my goals. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't have a relationship with reality, I do, because the only things that are gonna move you towards your goals are things that are both true and optimistic. If it's not true, then you won't make progress because you the, the definition of true is the thing that allows you to better predict the future. And so, and the way that people are gonna react or the way the world's gonna react, whatever. And so to make progress towards your goals, you need something that's true, but you also need it to be optimistic. So I'm checking myself against my emotion. I'm gonna have a negative emotion because that's what nature needs, right? Nature's trying to keep me alive long enough to have kids that have kids. Nature's not trying to make sure I enjoy my life. Nature's not trying to make sure that I achieve my goals. Nature has one goal and one goal only. Make sure I stay alive long enough to have kids that have kids. Now, embedded in all of that is my need to serve the community, my need to improve myself, my need to do hard things, like all of it. But once I know, that's the evolutionary motivation. Like, that's where that's coming from. So now I'm like, okay, I need to understand how the brain works. I need to understand what the emotions are. I need to understand what triggered the emotion. And so while I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek about, no, go ahead and stay in your emotion. The reality is I'm just trying to understand my emotions and then go, okay, how much of this emotion is useful in, in terms of moving me towards my goal? And then the exact amount of that emotion that's useful, I'm gonna use it and move forward. And then when you hit the point where it stops being useful, then you're gonna stop doing it. And I'll give you a, a fascinating example from my marriage. This was one of those moments where my wife, on a dime, changed my behavior patterns. It was amazing. <laughs> And you know the story. The funny thing is- I don't is, know what you're about to say. I've said it so many times, but you're gonna immediately be like, oh yeah, actually I remember that. Um, I was, so I have a real, real insecurity around my level of intellect. And I was just complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining about my intellect. And finally my wife goes, uh, complaining isn't sexy. Insecurity isn't sexy. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, wow, it's really not. Did I just say that harsh? You don't be, and Do I quote, <laughs> Insecurity is not sexy. And But was it harsh or was it like look babe? Harsh. It wow. was it was the verbal equivalent of grabbing me <laughs> by my No no no. I mean this to the letter of everything I'm saying. It was the verbal equivalent of grabbing me by my collar and punching me in the nose. And I was like, thank God for this woman. Because 
She didn't say it the first time I complained. She didn't say it the second or the third or the fourth or the 10th or the 20th or the 50th. But around the 100th time, she's like, you do understand, like this is not moving you forward. This isn't sexy, which is precisely what she knew I needed to hear. And I was like, thank you. And so that made me realize saying this, because one of the things I find most joyful in life is the way that she looks at me when we're alone and I do something cool. And I live for that, that's incredible. And so when she said that, I was like, wow, yeah, like I've really, I'm not looking for you to uplift me right now. I'm looking for you to woe is me with me. And that's not useful. It doesn't take me towards my goal. And so it was really cool. Now, my wife makes me feel loved in the most extraordinary ways possible. That's seriously advanced class. You can't tell somebody that message unless you have loved them so completely and elevated them so many times and made so many deposits in that bank that that thing was received as like, damn, that was exactly what I needed to hear. And so that kind of thing can be very, very powerful, but you have to understand how you can get in your own head, you can be leading yourself down a destructive path, you need to pattern interrupt that, you've got to be thinking what's gonna progress me towards my goal. So being concerned about my intellect is useful to a point, right? It makes me take things more seriously. It makes me go, hey, I'm not Elon Musk smart, so I'm gonna to have to like work harder, work differently, surround myself with intelligent people. So it makes me do those things, but the second it becomes corrosive, and now I'm diminishing myself, that's where you have to pattern interrupt. And so my wife gave me all the grace in the world to recognize it myself, to you know, try to lift me up. No, babe, come on, like you're one of the smartest people I know. She's very kind to me. And she gave me the space to try to process through it. But when it was just like self-evident, I was never getting to the other side without some sort of cold water to the face. She said it, and because I have that rule in my life that I only do and believe that which moves me towards my goal, what she was pointing out is by believing that you're not intelligent enough to accomplish your goals, you're not moving towards your goal. So you need to stop and you need to stop now. And I was like, word, I do. And that was so true. And again, I wanna contextualize this. If you've been an asshole to your partner for five years and you say this, this is just another tally in the asshole side. But if you are there, like we were just having this conversation yesterday and she came in the room. I live with her. We work in the same house we live with. I see this woman almost 365 days a year. I must see 362 days a year. I mean, it's literally absurd. She walked into the room and I lit up and she was like, you do that sometimes where you you will light up at the sight of me. And I'm like, yeah, because it's so ingrained in my nervous system that you're good. You make me feel good. You uplift me. You make me feel like the best version of myself. You look at me like you think I'm extraordinary. Like, And all of that, 22 years in, my nervous system is just like, good thing, right? And so when I'm surprised and this good thing walks into the room, I'm like, whoa. So I say all of that so people understand, you can't just go around saying the hard thing to people like that, like you have to earn that moment. But because she had earned that moment, it was so perfect. And you need those reminders to only sit in the negative motion, emotion, as long as it's effective. Because once it becomes corrosive, you've got to stop it, even if you think it's true. The number one question I get is from you, particularly younger people saying, I don't really understand what my life's task is. I call that a master your life's task. Please help me, Robert. The earlier you figure it out, the better off you are, but it can happen later in life. Now, I figured out at an early age that I wanted to write. I didn't know what I wanted to write, but I loved words and I loved writing. And if I didn't have that connection when I was eight years old, all the way into high school and college, I would have been a lost soul. And I empathize with a lot of people who don't have that feeling when they're eight or 18 or in their 20s. But I've tried to tell people, everybody has it. You're just not listening to yourself. You've lost touch with who you are, the core of your being. You're on social media too much. You're listening to what other people are telling you. You're listening to what your parents told you you should be doing in life. You're listening to what your friends think is cool. You gotta cut all that shit out. You gotta listen to yourself.
You have to be patient. It's not going to come like a light bulb in your head. Ah, I was meant to do this. I was meant to write the 48 Laws of Power. That's not how it works. It takes time. To do anything in life takes time and hours and patience and work. I recommend starting a journal and such and writing down some of the things that I think are important to you. So I like to tell people to go back to their earliest childhood memories of things that really excited them before they got mixed up with parents and teachers and all that other people telling them stuff, you know? Like for me, it was words and language. I just was entranced by the sound of language itself, right? It was like music to me. You had something like that. There's a book I recommend. It's a bit technical, but it's a brilliant book called The Five Frames of Mind by Howard Gardner. The point of this book is that there are five forms of intelligence. We normally associate intelligence with intellectuals, with our Noam Chomsky, with Albert Einstein. And he says, no, intelligence comes in all forms. Working with your hands is a form of intelligence. A carpenter has a high form of intelligence. People who are sports, who are athletic, who use their body, that's another form of intelligence. There's music, there's math, there's language. You have one of these frames of mind. By the way your brain is wired, you, have, you are inclined towards one of them. Figure that out. If you are somebody who's word-oriented and you end up going into a field that's about math or about numbers, you're in for a lot of pain in life right? So you've got to figure that kind of what I call primal connection to some kind of field. You have to look at the things that you love and the things that you hate, right? So early on entering the work world, I figured out that I don't like working for other people. I hate to say it. Some of it maybe maybe I'm antisocial in my car. I don't know. I hope not. But I don't like working for other people. I don't like all the politics, all the crap you have to put up with. I realized early on, I should gotta be working for myself, right? So what you don't like is very instructive to you, right? You're looking at things that are very powerful inside of you, that are emotional, they're not intellectual, they're thoughts, they're, I'm sorry, they're feelings, they're emotions, they're visceral things that you connect to, right? I've always been fascinated by our earliest ancestors. When I was eight years old, I wrote a novel probably the worst novel ever written in the history of mankind. And it was about the first human beings on the planet. And it was written from the point of view of a vulture watching these humans arrive. Stupid idea. But I was fascinated with early history of our origins, our roots, when I was very young. And that subject continues to fascinate me. If I ever read an article about, about Neanderthals and all the discoveries going on about their DNA, and I could read that forever. It's so fascinating. You have something like that. I know you do. And I am completely egalitarian. I believe everybody has that. When I wrote the book Mastery, which is what this book is about, to prove my point that everyone has it, I interviewed contemporary masters. And one of them is the woman Temple Grandin who was born with high level autism, right? She was gonna be hospitalized for her entire life. She, when she was two or three years old, she had the good luck of finding the right teacher who brought her out of her shell. And she eventually became a, a very um, respected professor of animal research, right? She's absolutely brilliant. She also studies autism itself. If somebody with that kind of disability, that kind of thing, you know, everything stacked against her. If she can reach, she can figure it out and reach mastery. Then I certainly believe everybody has that potential. But I know it doesn't come easy. It's a process, and you have to be patient. But you have to put in the work. We have so many young people who watch this show, tune into our content, and and they're filled with all sorts of pressures right now. All sorts of things that feel distracting. What's your advice? for the 20 year olds that are out there right now, dealing with a world that's very different than potentially how you and I grew up. But what's your advice for young people? Well, um, it's, it's don't be too hard on yourself and um, be patient. And so it's a kind of a mix that you have to go through, a bit of a dance. So on the one hand, you want to be serious about life. You're not, life doesn't go on forever. Your youth, will be over in 10, 12 years. You better believe it, it goes faster than you can imagine, right? Okay, so take it seriously, all right? So you, can, you, you wanna realize what your life's task is. You wanna develop those skills that will make it so when you're in your 30s, 
things will come together as they fortunately did for me. It's a common story that 31, 32 is, is that year where things turn around for people, right? But on the other hand, you don't want to be so damn serious, so damn you know, you know, uh, linear in your thinking. I've got to head down this path to make this amount of money, etc. You're young. Have some fun, have some adventure, have some excitement. But at the same time, also have that sense of discipline, and that sense of purpose. You can do both things at the same time. Now the circumstances now, it's easy for me, a boomer, I have to admit that, to preach to you when you have to gone through like two, we've gone through a pandemic, a made, a, what looks like to be a recession. And then if you're a millennial, you went through another, you went through the crash in 08. It's easy for me to preach. You're dealing with really difficult circumstances. And there's what they call what the great resignation now, is that it, right? So a lot of people are rethinking their lives. They don't want to work at crap jobs just to get by. And I applaud that 100%, right? That's great. So you want to think about working for yourself is the ultimate position in this world. And even though times are difficult, even though it may seem like a, just a dream, there's so much potential out there for entrepreneurial spirit, for creating your own startup, for creating your own podcast, for going your own path in life. You don't have to follow other people. It's not like it was when I was growing up. There were things that were better back then, but there are things that were a lot worse, right? You have so many more options. It's just that you're not going to reach them. You're not going to be happy in this short time that you have to be alive unless you take it seriously, unless you learn skills and develop and go through an apprenticeship in your 20s, etc. So um, if you can balance those two and still have some fun and adventure and excitement like I did, I mean, I don't want to hold myself up as some model, but, you know, being an Irishman in Paris in my early 20s, you know, I was having adventures, right? So just don't listen to your parents go, I got to be making $100,000 when I'm 23 and go to law school and do all this stuff. You're going to burn out. So kind of understand your, I guess the main thing I would say is know who you are, know what, what your, what your, you know, deep down your core, what you love, what you hate, and what you were destined to create in this world. That's like the most important process you can go through. Robert, you've written about you know, so many laws across your books. I'm curious if there are three principles that you feel like are most important for people to keep in mind and to live by. Well, uh, one of them is a law of power that I've kind of lived by, vert, you know, consciously and inadvertently, which is interaction with boldness. So most people are just too timid in life. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid of making mistakes. If I never try anything, that I never have to put up with criticism, never have to put up with people scrutinizing me, right? So most people end up being too shy, too timid in life. And you've got to get over that. And you've got to learn how to be bold with your ideas and with your actions. So I try to make each one of my books kind of a statement and, and impress people with like a strong, you know, idea and not be afraid of criticism and not being afraid of controversy. So boldness has gotten me through life and I think it's critically important in, in this day and age. The second thing is something we've talked about earlier, but it's knowing who you are, knowing yourself in depth, shining that mirror, looking inside, deep inside of you, who you are and what makes you different and going through that process in as profound a way as possible to, sh to know, to understand deeply what makes you an individual, what separates you from your parents, your siblings and your peers. And so that it's like having a radar system in you. So I know this about me and now this person is offering me this job. No, that's not who I am. That's not suited for me. Get out of here. Somebody offers me something else. Yes, that's me. Okay, I'll take it. It's like an internal radar system that'll guide you through life. The third thing is, it's knowing about yourself, but it's also knowing about people. And it seems like an easy thing, but the problem most people have is we are self-absorbed. We're more interested in our own thoughts and ruminations and our own ideas than, than the thoughts and ideas and experiences of other people. We will deny it, we'll, go, we'll die kicking and screaming, saying, no, that's not true, but it is true. It's because you're not listening to other people. You're not really fascinated by other people. 
and I'm saying empathy and the ability to truly listen to people and to get inside their skin and understand how they think, how they experience the world, how it's different to be them and what they're like, is a, not only a great form of therapy, because it gets you outside yourself, gets outside of your own self-absorption, but it's a very powerful tool. It will allow you to understand people on a deep level, understand their psychology, so you won't be making all kinds of mistakes and saying thing, exactly the wrong thing to say to this person or that person. So developing a high level sensitivity to people, and it begins with being fascinated by people and their differences in their world. And that's to me an extremely important skill in life. Time is uh, not something that you use. Time is the basis of your life. Your life is time. We have a brief moment of life here. Both in terms of time and space, we occupy just a speck in this cosmos. So let's not think too much about ourselves. If we understand the context of our existence, we are just a small pop-up on this planet and will pop out. Most people who are lazy are also bitter about something. There's, there is no sense of profoundness to their life. They always feel insufficient. That's not the way to live. If you are very pleasant and you have a profound experience of life, you have a right to do nothing, absolutely nothing. I don't know many people that consciously wake up and think, I want to be lazy or I want to lean towards death. What do you think it is that's getting in the way of people's potential? Well, uh, most things that human beings do are not done consciously, unfortunately. It is mostly compulsively done and that is a whole problem with humanity. With the level of intelligence and competence that we have, the moment we function compulsively, we become destructive. If you become conscious, naturally you will curtail so many of your actions because they are absolutely unnecessary. Either you're trying to be better than somebody which you can never be and uh, or you're trying to do something in competition with the rest of the world, wanting to prove some nonsense that you, nobody is uh, convinced about anyway. And all these countless number of people who existed on this planet before you and me, all those idiots also were doing the same thing. But where are they now? They're all topsoil. You and me also will be topsoil after some time. I find that a really helpful point. I think one of the things that drives people oftentimes when they're not wanting to be lazy is that they want to compete. They want to, they want to surpass somebody else or surpass something that's in their mind. But it sounds like what you're saying is that one of the best ways to get over that, to, to stop being lazy, is to actually not focus so much on yourself and to not compete. No, I'm not like saying that. don't compete, Sorry. compete or whatever. Essentially, you're thinking life is a race, right? This is coming from the understanding that life is a race. If life is a race, what is the goal? You must get to the finish line faster than others. You know what's the finish line? You want to get there sooner than me? Don't do that, man <laughs> <laughs> That finish line sounds like death. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. Finish line is death. So if you want to win the race, you must go ahead of me. Please don't do that. I am older than you, let me go first, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> this whole nonsense about wanting to be better than somebody is happening because you have not found any sense of profoundness in your own existence. If you pay enough attention to life, then you will see, when I say life, life is a, an explosion happening all around you. Not just, you see, the basic misunderstanding is when people use the word life, they are talking about their work, they are talking about their family, their relationships, their wealth, their money. No, these are all accessories, frills to life. Frills are fine, only if you have a skirt, frills are good. Otherwise, it's an embarrassment, all right? Right now, this is the situation of the modern world. People have too many frills, but no skirt. There's no profoundness to life, too much decoration. Where will it go? It will only lead to more frustration. They are saying in United States, which is the richest nation in the world, on an annual basis, about 120,000 people are committing suicide. A whole lot of them are below 35 years of age. I don't know the exact percentage, but a major percentage are below 35 years of age. Why are they doing this? 
they are doing this because there is no sense of profoundness. There is no struggle for survival, survival is taken care of. Now you need profoundness, if there is no profoundness, you wonder why are you alive? Well, uh, the Europeans, or rather the English have made this question very popular, to be or not to be, as if that is the most intelligent question to ask. I am telling you, if you are right now, you wake up in the morning and you're blissed out, do you ask to be or not to be? Only a miserable person asks that question. Essentially, when you ask the question, to be or not to be, what you are saying is a brief moment of life that you have on this planet, you are thinking whether to cut it short further. This is because time is a very relative experience. On a given day, you're very joyful. Have you noticed on that day, twenty-four hours, poof, went, went off like a moment? Another day, you're miserable or de depressed, twenty-four hours feels like ten thousand years. So only miserable people can have a long life. So those miserable people raise all these kind of questions and make it like it's some great philosophy. Life is not a philosophy. Philosophy is a silly explanation to a life which is a phenomena beyond all explanations. You can only experience this, you can't deduct it into your philosophy. The moment you deduct it into your philosophy, you become a constipated life. That means it happens little by little. It doesn't happen like an explosion <laughs> And how did it materialize for you? Did, did you learn what you teach or did you discover it? I have neither learned nor discovered anything, I'm alive. So what is life I see? Let me make this very clear for all those people who are thinking uh, some fantastic things about me. I know only one thing. I don't know too many things, I just know only one thing. Today even a five-year-old five year child claims to know hundred things. I know only one thing, I know this piece of life from its origin to its ultimate. I only talk about this life, but the world assumes I'm talking about them, because fortunately life is made the same way within them also, on the surface. Plants think I'm talking about them, the worms think I'm talking about them, every other human being thinks I'm talking about them. I am only talking about this because this is the only thing I know. And actually, this is true even for you right now, because you don't know anything other than what happens within you. See, right now you think you're looking at me through this video. No, it is entering your lenses, going an inverted image in the retina, you see this image also only within you. You've seen the entire world only within you. Everything that you saw, heard, smelled, tasted and touched happen only within you. If you touch somebody else's hand like this, you think you're experiencing their hand. No, you're only experiencing the sensations which happen in your hand, isn't it? If your hand goes numb, if you touch something, there is nothing there, all right? So your whole experience of life is only happening within you. If you know this life, in… in reflection, you know everything in that sense. But actually you know only one thing, rest is all imagination and that imagination has no fundamentals. The past is actually a representation of who I am now rather than who I am now, is a representation of my past. I want to write this down because yeah. I feel like that just yeah. blew my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, so when you're thinking about neuroscience um, and you're even just thinking about memory in general, memory is always a reconstruction in the present. So if I was to think right now about last week, that would be different than if I was thinking about it a week from now. In a week from now, I'll be slightly different. I'll, I'll be in a different context. A diff and so if I'm thinking back uh, a few weeks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in a different place. And so the main thing is, is, is that who you are in the present is basically what is creating the past. Obviously, the past influences who you are in the present. It's kind of a, a circular, but memory is always a reconstruction in the present. And one of my favorite psychologists, he wrote a book called Time and Psychological Explanation. His name is Brent Slife, but he said that it's more accurate to say that the present causes the meaning of the past than to say that the past causes the meaning of the present. How would, you, how would you offer advice to somebody who feels like, this all sounds cool, Dr. Benjamin, but I'm literally locked in the moment right now. And I, I don't have a lot of headspace or slack in my life to do anything otherwise. Yeah, definitely. One thought I will say to this person that you're describing is, is like it's very common to get absorbed in the present and to, and to think that the present is all that matters rather than to kind of thoughtfully look at it, maybe get in touch. 
And getting in touch with your future self is very similar to just honestly meditation. Um, it's, it's not the same as meditation, but it could be a form of meditation. And so I would argue if you're not taking time regularly, even to just sit and just like think for even like five or 10 minutes, but like that everything feels too overwhelming, then you're, at, from my view, you're definitely like probably off course. And like, so getting connected with the future self, a lot of it's just really about like, am I on the right track? Am I on a track I want to be on? Do I like this? It's really a way of having conversations with yourself. Um, it's very in line with just the whole framework of important versus urgent, right? And so it's like if everything feels urgent and you're not connected to what's important, then you're probably not making massive strides forward. You're probably on autopilot. You're probably on, on the hamster wheel. So I think it's extremely important, even if you feel stressed, even if you feel busy, even if you feel like you don't have those five minutes to just go and sit and sit in your journal and just write all the things you're sure, you probably need that more than anyone. But you never reach a point when you don't need that. You never reach a point when you mm. don't need those 10 minutes. Mm. Um, it's a continuous process of, of clarity and of, of making progress and of, of learning to prioritize and learning self-awareness. And so we all need it. Um, we can all get overly, overly absorbed in the present by the stresses of it and then downplay our future. So it's, I think it's very common. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just jotting this down, but I... I I want to ask in a moment about trauma because I feel like it adds a bit of a different piece to it. But um, two things are coming to mind right now is, you know, if someone had five minutes and wanted to start this, like they're bought in, um, what, would, what would somebody do? I've got, I've got five minutes of my day. That's all I got. What would be the practice that I get into? I would honestly actually start, if you only are going to give yourself five minutes, period, flat, actually do it at night. Okay. Um, so do it at night. And, and if you would or could... So research shows that 90% of people procrastinate sleep by just mindless scrolling. And so they're literally procrastinating sleep yeah. and literally putting their future self in a hole the next morning because of mindless consumption. So, and we all, you know, that's very common. And so it's, in my view, what you do in the last hour of your day is the most potent form of habit formation. So like what we do at night, right before we sleep is going to inform our habits way more than any other period of the day. Um, and so a lot of huge, huge amount of research on this, that if you just simply at the end of your day, pull out your journal and just write down three things from that day that you are grateful for. It's so basic, but it's shown dramatically to increase happiness and to increase sleep quality. Hmm. It just gets things down, but also if you just give yourself three to five minutes, a lot of times because people are not practiced at this, and I, I have different iterations of this. I have... Uh, in my mind, a lot deeper forms of reflection than just simply writing what you're grateful for. But this is like a, honestly, just a start because it trains people to look back at the day and to think about it and to just simply say, you know, uh, then the initial reaction, if I ask my three, you know, my older three kids who are teenagers, what are you, what are you happy about from the day or what are you grateful for? I'll sometimes just say literally nothing. Hmm. And it's like, well, then think about it. Hmm. What happened today? What could you be grateful for? Um, and so by actually thinking about it and pondering it, they'll say, well, actually, you know, that person at work was super nice to me. I'm grateful for that. Like, so now they're starting to take ownership of their past. They're starting to create the frame. They're starting to actually pull usefulness from it. And so they can then think, well, today actually was pretty great. Or, or there was components yeah, of today yeah. that were all right. And so just by simply doing that, that's a, that's a great start. My, my view is, is you can take it a step further because um, that would be yeah. shape, that would be kind of providing meeting or, or kind of looking back and reshaping how you're interpreting now. Like that's a that's, that's a what you're doing. Stuff, right? Reflection. You are shaping the meaning of the past in the present in your journal, and but, you're now framing the day as useful. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And so I think that, that idea of like gratitude journals makes sense. I'm curious how it connects to the future self part because look, you know, reflection is is a different mechanism than looking forward. So then, yeah. what's that piece look like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Well, so, so here's how I do it. I actually don't do it in that form, but that's like honestly basic. Okay. Like, if people, like really, if, if people really want to get started and they only have five minutes and they're not. So how I do it is, and this is still starting with the night. How I do it is, is at the end of the day, I think how am I different from who I was when I woke up? The reason this is super important, I know that this is not future self, this is me again re-relating to my past self, is, is that if I thought about it, just like with thinking about those three gratitudes, if I actually think about it, and I say, how am I a different person than I was this morning when I woke up? The initial reaction would be, I'm not. It's only been like 12 hours. How could I be different? But if I really think about it, what do I now know that I didn't know before? 
um, what, you know, what experiences have I had that my prior self hadn't had when I had just woken up? And if I actually think about it, just like gratitude, I'm creating the frame of my past. I actually can and do see that I am different than my past self, even 12, 13 hours ago or the night before, 24 hours ago. And by, by actually focusing on that and by appreciating that, I now acknowledge that I've changed, which increases my psychological flexibility. It allows me to see that I am not the same person, that I am growing, that I am evolving, which is really useful for then getting skillful at, re, you know, at thinking of your future self as a different person. If I'm different from who I was 24 hours from now, then it's, it's likely that my future self could be different in 24 hours in positive, meaningful, and even self-directed ways. And so I just think that it's really, mastery of the past is, is very powerful for also developing mastery of your future. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to note, yeah, note that. Yeah. I mean, I'm very happy to share starter points on getting connected to the future self, but I just think that it's, it's incredibly useful to, to recognize the differences between your current and your past self and also very useful to be explicit about that. And by writing it down, that's actually part of the integration process. Um, it actually creates change that would not have been there if you hadn't done that process. If I didn't do that at night, then there are certain changes that would not have occurred because I didn't think about it and because I didn't frame it and because I didn't make it explicit and say, oh, here's how I'm different from my past self. You know, Maybe I was a lot more thoughtful in this conversation, right? than maybe I would have been a week ago or even than I was yesterday. And so by writing it down, I've now made that change more potent than it would have been had I not done that. And so it's a, I think that that's really powerful. I would say one other really th important thing here is, is in recognizing that I'm not my past self, whether it's 24 hours ago or whether it's 10 months ago, I have nothing but empathy for my past self. Uh, I, I'm not carrying around a past self that I'm angry at. I don't have any regrets because I'm not the same person as my past. They were operating from a different framework. Um, and so... The future self is the same. My future self is insanely empathetic towards my current self. My future self uh, has way more wisdom, perspective, context than I do. And so it allows me a lot of freedom to make mistakes, which is a huge aspect of having a growth mindset. Fixed mindset means you're afraid of making mistakes, afraid of trying new things, afraid of um, you know, being wrong. I mean, a fixed mindset means that you really are dogmatic and fragile and so you, you don't want to be wrong. Whereas if I know that my future self has better perspectives, uh, then I'm okay making mistakes. I'm okay trying new things. I think people need to hear that. I think, I think that's really powerful. But like, I'm curious on the trauma side. So I just came across this stat that 60% of Americans will have trauma in their life and have PTSD. And so to me, that's not just, I mean, part of it's having empathy for your past self, but there's a, a moment or something locked in time or a trigger that's just causing you to keep getting pulled back there. How... How could this be applied to help somebody get unlocked from something that feels very traumatic in that way? Yeah, uh, obviously, we you know, you're not given the toolkit <laughs> when you're born yeah, yeah, yeah. to to having what what I'm calling psychological flexibility. This is a a really high bar of what would be called emotional intelligence. Um, but the more emotionally intelligent you get, again, the less dogmatic you see a certain thing, and so. From my view, trauma is typically, certainly it was an insanely unexpected, painful emotional experience that um, is continuing to impact you now. Even if you're long away from the experience, uh, if, if the trauma is still impacting you, then you're, you're still framing it such that it's still actually happening, which is, which is really interesting. Um, there is a lot of research that even shows, obviously having a conversation about it with someone is useful, um, further research showing if you can just think about what you learned from it. So that's a big part of post-traumatic growth. I'm a lot more aggressive about it, uh, frankly. Like, I'm, I'm regularly seeking to turn it into benefits as fast as possible, which is, um, it fits along the lines of anti-fragile versus fragile. So like anti-fragile is a framework created by Nassim Taleb, but it's really about how no matter what happens to you, whether you're at a peak or in a valley, whatever, if it's, if it's something negative, you're as soon as possible turning it into benefits, um, turning it into gains would be the language that we use. Anti-fragile is what it's called. Oh yeah, anti-fragile means that it's the opposite of fragile. So fragile means if something negative happens, um, you know, you're worse off as a result. It creates more entropy into the future. Um, and that's also a view where the past is driving the present. Yep. But if you recognize that it's actually the present that, re that drives the past, that, you know, and I'm talking purely in psychological terms, 
that it's the present. It drives the that, meaning of the past. Deeply, yeah. It, it, it drives the framing of the past, the context, which determines the content, um, the angle. And so if I know that, even if I, you know, this is not as traumatic as we're talking about, where we're talking about PTSD, although, you know, I've gone through extreme trauma, adopted three, you know, kids went through the foster system who they've had trauma. But even if I have a conversation, say, with my 15-year-old son, and it just doesn't go well. Like, I honestly, I don't handle it well. Um, I have a choice. Like, I either can re- re- reshape it, reshape the meaning of that conversation, turn it into something beneficial, um, turn it into learning and growth, or just let it be. Uh, and, and if I don't do anything about it, then the past is going to dictate the present rather than the present dictating the past. And so... Um, from my standpoint, it, it's just very useful for me to know that either on a time frame, so let me just say like from here to the last year, or specific events, I have a lot of control over what those mean. I have a lot of control over framing what it means. What does my last year mean? What was the good of it? What was, you know, do I want to look at it from a positive or from a negative, but also specific events? My parents getting divorced, right? Me being in a, a car crash that almost kills my mom, right? I can think on certain events... And I can say, well, there's one of two ways. Either my present is, is shaping it or it's shaping my present. And usually with trauma, the past is still determining the present. There isn't a lot of proactive in the present taking control, approaching it, um, and wanting to do something about it. You, you have, you can't, it's not going to change in a positive way by chance. Mm-hmm. It literally has to by choice. And at some point, you have to directly approach it and decide, I'm going to do something different here. I'm going to look at this different. Everything is approach or avoid. Well, Everything is approach yeah, or avoid. Yeah. I've got, I've got, I feel like I've got so many questions forming, but you mentioned- Go ahead and throw it. I mean, we can work on this. second framework you wanted to bring up, and so I just want to circle back. I mean, I don't know if it's directly useful anymore. Okay. Um, I think that, uh, I, I just want to emphasize really quickly what we're saying, that the past is either an asset or it's a liability. And if it's an asset, that means it's something that's continuing to pay you more and more. You believe that the present and future are better as a result. Um, that, there, that because of that experience, you're continuing to get kind of interest in the present and future. Whereas if it's a liability, you believe it's continuing to drain your present and future. And that is all based on how you're choosing to frame it, what you're choosing to do with it. And in the beginning, you may not feel like you have choice in the matter. Like, how could you see it any different? Yeah. Um, and... That's like the ability to get to the point where you, where you start to try and you start to believe that it's possible and then you start to work on it, maybe even start to get help in looking at it from a different angle, starting to learn from it, starting to um, think that it was something useful. Even if you, you, could, you could find reasons, just like finding things you're grateful for mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you've got to like actually exert some creativity on it. You have to actually like, it is creativity, yeah, just yeah. as much as creativity towards your future. Quest was already a billion dollar company and my mum was still morbidly obese. And I was trying, because I care about her so much, I just want her to live for a long time. I don't care about you know what she looks like. She's like, mum, I want you to eat healthy so you can be around for a long time. And I tried to you know give her free Quest bars. I offered to pay for trainers for her. And every time I would say, you know, mum, like, what can I do? How can I help? She just said, I'm too old, I can't. And over time we realized the power of the mind. The Quest was amazing for people that were going into the gym, picking up a Quest bar or like thinking, oh, I want to eat something healthy today. But it was meant nothing to the people that felt depressed, had anxiety, or didn't believe in themselves enough to even go after picking up a healthy protein bar. We really started to realize that to create actual impact, like actual impact, we need to go after. Now, the two of you have built two successful businesses. One that sold for a billion dollars, the next that's reached a billion people. Progress can look like a lot of things. So have there been trade-offs in this pursuit of progress? Ah. <laughs> have there a been lot. trade-offs yeah. in this So as he was actually saying it, one other thing that we do that I think is extremely powerful is we play a game called No Bullshit, What Would It Actually Take? So once we sit there and go, what is our goal? To build a studio as big as Disney. 
All right, before you even get started, we sit there and go, what? Like, no BS, don't try and say like the things that we want it to be true. But actually, what is true, that what would need to be true in order for us to build a studio as big as Disney? And so we sat there and we said, okay, it's gonna take us to put our own capital in. It's gonna take us to work hard. What does work hard look like? Is it a certain amount of hours? It's a, is it a certain amount of achievements where you put things into place and you make sure you're always incrementally working towards that? Is it that you, maybe you have to, um, so this is exactly what we did with Quest it was oh we have to put the house on the line and that was like the no BS that's what it's going to take for us to go all in and build Quest Nutrition and so once we sat there and said okay it's going to take us to put our house on the line it's going to take me at the time to be the, the supportive wife to come in and help you out it's going to take no vacations it's going to mean you're going to need to take a third of your pay cut like we literally sat down and wrote a laundry list of what it's going to take to start in Quest Nutrition and once we had that list we just looked at each other and we're like, all right, are we willing to do it? And if the answer, when the answer is yes, now you just know what you're heading towards. You know the type of path that you're about to approach. And so there's no surprises. There's no all of a sudden him coming home and going, yeah, babe, so the business isn't doing well. And so, oh my God, I'm so sorry, but we lose our house, right? There's no surprise. We've established what we're going to do in order to go for that goal. And in that comes the sacrifices. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are the things that you're okay with, um, putting aside for now. And a lot of that was, um, I think you said it earlier, my self-esteem, my ego of like, I didn't know what I was doing. So every day I'm struggling, I'm trying to figure something out and I keep failing. But I knew that I had to learn in order to get to the goal that we wanted to get to. So I knew every day I had to get back up. And then the same with him, with the skill sets. What skill sets do I have to learn in order to get to the goal that we we have to we, we want to get to? And that comes with a lot of freaking sacrifices. Mm. I, I think that's really powerful. I mean, the way you because excuses are a big thing for you, right? And it feels like that no BS list is almost like an excuse breaker. It's because you you've written it down, right? So we we put it down. We know what's on the line. There's no, there's no surprises to the trade-offs. Like there are trade-offs, but we know them. And we've actually confronted the excuses before they, before they become that burden in our ear. Is that true? A thousand percent. And I think you said this, the thing with excuses is sometimes they're very true. And, but it doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve your goal. So are you going to let it sit with you or are you going to find a way around it? So let's say a lot of people's reasoning, which was ours originally when we wanted to make movies is we don't have enough money. So we're just gonna go and do this thing until we have enough money. We don't have enough time. And the truth is, if you play the no BS, what would it actually take? And you say, I don't have enough money. Then you keep going down and go, well, how much do I, money do I need? Okay, what would it take for me to get that money? And sometimes people don't wanna look at the answers. So maybe it takes you having to sell your house, move in with your in-laws, and rent one of their bedrooms for the next three years um, in order to save your money so that you can go and start a company. Well, some people don't want to do that. Okay, well at least now you have your answer and you're not sitting there using the excuse that you don't have enough money. You just looked at it and like, oh, to take, for me to get there, I need to live with my in-laws for three years. I don't want to do that. And now you've just decided. And now you're not beating yourself up over, oh my God, I can't believe I'm not there yet. Or like with us with Quest, there was no, we didn't leave ourselves any room with ex for excuses because we just went down that list of, are we giving this over? Are we doing this? Are we actually showing up? And if the answer is no, then how can you expect to reach your goal? So for me, it really was the mindset was the big key. And then over time, as we started to talk about mindset and building a studio, because that was our background, we really started to realize that to create actual impact, like actual impact, we need to go after the younger kids because the age of imprint is between 11 and 15. That's the period where they're most susceptible to the messaging. And so if we really want to do no BS, what is it actually going to take to make global change on people's mindset? You've got to get them young. So we basically sat down and said, what does that look like? What type of studio do we build? And then for me, my personal thing has just been leaning more and more into young girls. It's I could wake up every single freaking day and fight for that 14 year old girl that was me that didn't believe in herself, that felt ugly, that was teased, that was made fun of for my looks. I will fight for that 14 year old girl so that if I can touch her then and let her know and have her help, help her to believe she can become anything she wants if she sets her mind to it and works hard, then I feel like my job is done. But it has to be to me, 
on a global scale at that age, um, that's how you really make real change. So every day I wake up for that 14-year-old Lisa. You know, work ethic starts to boil down to how do I actually manage my days? Like, how do I actually get up in the morning, get something rolling, and do this 365 days a year, or whatever the pattern is over that time? So do you have, and I'm looking at you, Lisa, do you have routines, rituals that feel like, okay, all of this stuff is true, but it's going to come down to me waking up and then having another great day. And then tomorrow, waking up and having another solid day, like that pursuit of progress. What are the rituals and routines that you have? Yeah, I definitely have because I've ha um, had a lot of health issues. So for like six years, I've been dealing with just like the worst gut um, issues you can possibly imagine. So when it first happened, I couldn't eat for like at least, it was what? Four? I was legitimately afraid she was going to die. It was that scary. So for about six months, I was on like three or four ingredients. I couldn't even put pepper on my food. I was in such gastro gast gast stress that because I couldn't eat, my hair was falling out, my nails were brittle, my stomach had been protruded out to here. So my her blood was glucose was in the. 40, low 40s, upper 30s, which is like you may start having a seizure territory. Yeah, and I was just permanently there for a year. Um, and six years later, I'm still struggling. So just to kind of give you an idea of how bad it was. Because of that, I realized I had um, re ignored my body. We were building quests. I focused on how many hours am I putting in? Am I on the grind? How do I make sure that I show up? Because I was so insecure, I definitely thought that if I put more hours in, it would like outweigh how um, incompetent I was. And so I just kept putting more and more hours in. I was ignoring my health. My health absolutely fell apart. And since that day that my health fell apart, I said, I cannot show up for other people if I don't take care of myself. It's obviously very cliche. We have the whole oxygen mask now before you put it on someone else, but it's so true and it took my health literally falling apart for me to realize oh Lisa you are a human being you have to listen to your gut you have to pay attention to your body that then created an entire system of a morning routine for me that sets me up for success because how am I supposed to impact people if I can't even take care of myself so I created a morning routine that was definitely optimized to me. I tried a million different things. I tried meditating. I hated it. I tried yoga. I fucking hated it. And then I realized my jam was going into the gym and lifting heavy weights, listening to music and singing at the top of my lungs. Some, you know, Destiny's Child songs. Like that was my jam. I realized I felt so good after I did that. So I started to stop listening to other people telling me what I should do. And I just left space to experiment in the morning with a different thing. So I got up and I read and I was like, this is really boring, right? So I just tried a bunch of things and then saw what was the best for me. Same with the food. My breakfast has all been optimized because of my gut health. I've tested so many different foods to see what sets me up for the day with brain clarity, with energy. That's all to do with experimentation. Once I found all these moments of optimization, I then created my morning routine. But the biggest thing, the biggest thing that changed it for me was my Saturday routine. I take Saturday mornings off completely. I switch my phone off. I tell all of my, I've told all of my friends, all of my family, you cannot reach me on Saturdays. Period. My friend, and of course, everyone pushes back. What do you mean? What if we need you for, you know, emergencies? And I was like, you can text Tom. I'm with him. And so, you know, you kind of start telling more people, more people just like, yeah, but what if I don't have Tom's number? It's like, but you know him who knows Tom. And you're like, but what if I don't know someone that knows Tom? Said with love, then I, you're not close enough to me to warrant disturbing my self-care time. And so I've made it a rule. I got massive pushback. I stuck by my boundary because I set this boundary up for my own self-care so that I could show up for everyone else. And so I set this boundary, I stuck to my boundary. And now like years later, everyone respects it so much that if I go to say to someone, oh, okay, yeah, let's do it on a Saturday. They'd be like, no, 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 your phone's off. I'm not gonna talk to you. And so setting that boundary, setting that space, and then I'm creative. So I pick up a pencil and I just draw, it's all I do. And that's my time, that is what we call selfish time. It is my selfish time. And every Saturday, I do everything I possibly can to be at my art desk um, and serve myself first. So that is imperative. If I don't do it for a couple of weeks, I notice the difference in my spirit, my energy, my happiness, my enthusiasm, how I show up in our relationship, how I show up as a leader, everything.
there's going to be some obstacles um, that we feel that you know we can't over overcome or when you're on your path to success there's always going to be those roadblocks here and there so i tore all pretty much all the ligaments in my right ankle uh, i end up uh, finding out the next day after the game that i had broke my fibula i'm pretty sure a lot, probably a lot of people probably doubt it i mean the city of philadelphia they doubted i'm sure that i would have been ready and i told them i was like yo i said if the team uh, when they win or if they make it to the playoffs they make it to the super bowl i told them with no hesitation, I said, I'll be ready. I may not be considered the GOAT in some people's eyes, but if you look at me and you look at my highlight, I definitely fit the description. But at the end of the day, we're all gonna struggle. I struggled, but I didn't quit. And that's what I encourage a lot of people to do. Just don't quit. You mentioned the idea of belief in yourself and one of the things about what we do is we we attract a lot of people who are are pursuing that belief in themselves and some days they're on the right side of it and some days they're not on the right side of it but you talk about as you started to believe more and more in yourself if you were to talk to somebody who right now who's who's struggling in that regard what would you say to somebody who needs to believe in themselves i uh, probably will say just take advantage of the opportunities um that you're given um and i think it'll take it'll take you further than you can ever imagine if you just stay on course. Um, you know, I think for me personally, I, I, what set me apart, I think from everyone else is that my dedication and my discipline and just the execution of being consistent is what put me in a different stratosphere, just put me on a, a different level. And I think people were able to see that. Um, sometimes, like I said, I didn't want to just blend in. I wanted to stand out. And so even with my daughter who's playing volleyball now, um, she was, I mean, she, right now she's a better athlete than I, honestly, than I was in high school. Um, she Now she plays, uh, she, she's going into her senior year, um, but she, she plays volleyball. Um, she, she was playing on the varsity, varsity uh, volleyball team as a freshman. And I, I mean, I, I, I can't say enough about her and what she's able to accomplish. And I wanted to instill the confidence in her and, and really just share with her what she, what she's accomplishing and what she's doing because that doesn't happen all the time. When I was in high school, there were a couple of athletes on our football team, basketball team that played at the varsity level as freshmen and sophomores. That's that's a sign of greatness. That's something that's potential. That's that's showing that showing you that you have ability that's well beyond where you are. And so for me uh, and anybody else, um, that's how you can measure yourself. Measure, you have to be realistic and measure yourself against, uh, you know, kids, your peers, and really, uh, you, know, you know, peers that are a little bit better than you. And so for me, um, that's what I did. And, and I saw that I wasn't as great as everybody else. I was a realist. And I knew that I had to put a little bit of more, uh, a little bit uh, of, of extra work uh, in order to get on their level, because I knew that I was a late bloomer. Um, I figured it out. Like, yeah, I was a late bloomer, but competitively inside, I had the mindset that I was just as good as they were. Uh, but coaches obviously saw it different uh, because they're be uh, they're better at evaluating talent uh, and, and skill set um, than I than I did. Because obviously, we're going to think highly uh, of ourselves and, and want to put ourselves in you know on the same uh, plateau as some of our, our teammates and peers or what have you. But um, that was just something that I that I wanted to. Uh, to accomplish it. And so my daughter, like I said, she's accomplishing something well beyond what I did as a, as a freshman, sophomore, uh, a junior in high school. And at the end of the day, I think what made me who I am is that I had a strong dissatisfaction at, w at, at where I was as an athlete, um, you know, starting out. Strong dissatisfaction with where I was at as an athlete. That's, that's unreal. You talk about discipline, I and mean, we still see it. We still see the way you can still step on the football field at 47 and, and literally light it up. Um, take us into your daily routines. How do you stay as disciplined as you are? As I said earlier, I think you just have to be consistent. Um, consistency is key. Not only just um, I didn't. I, I realized that not only in just uh, an athlete, uh, just in athletics or sports or what have you. Um, but it's very key in, in, in every aspect of your life. And I think um, sports and outside of sports, uh, business, um, just even in personal relationships or just uh, just 
establishing um, you know a rapport a bond even with family communication consistency uh, is key with anything but I think like I said the most part uh, the best part uh, about it and the most important part is communication um, and so I started to realize that um, later on um, as my career progressed um, if you can communicate and uh, know how and understand how to uh, communicate with you know uh, your peers, coaches, um, and and be receptive um, to a constructive criticism. Um, then I think you you give your, yourself an opportunity to grow um, not only as a person but as an athlete at the same time. Because there's there's always communication in in everything that that we do. And I think if there's a a, a great um, I guess rapport or uh, great lines uh, lines of communication. Um, where it's harmonious and uh, and I think being able to listen um, instead of so being so quick to to respond or speak um, then I think you know things will you know you'll see a lot of things a lot clearer but I think what we underestimate sometimes is your mindset and and the character it took to come out of a small school hit the NFL and and be a late bloomer and to rise up. What do you think, if you think about that idea of skill set and mindset, what's your edge over everyone else? I think no different than anybody else, but I'm sure a lot of athletes that have, you know, obviously achieved an amount of success, I think when their doubt creeps in or there's naysayers or there's doubters, I think the, the best thing that I ever did, I ever did, obviously, I think was believe in myself. Uh, that's first and foremost. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, for me, I just be. It, it, I saw and I listened to what the coach, you know, uh, said, and they saw in me, which was uh, a lot of potential, um, and I just wanted to build on that. And so, um, with me, I think you know, if I didn't have the the, the coaches that push me, um, push me beyond really kind of I think my own limits or my own expectations, I don't think that I would have become uh, the receiver that I became. I don't think I would have been this guy that became T.O. Um, obviously, like I said, when you talk about uh, physically, I fit the description um, of, of, of an athlete. I fit the description of one of those physically uh, imposing receivers, uh, I guess, became a poster child for prototypical receivers that came after me. Because um, if you look at the, 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 the transition uh, of the receiver position, before me and after me, they started to become bigger, faster, and stronger. Uh, you think of guys like uh, Calvin Johnson, they called him Megatron. You think of uh, uh, Julio Jones. Uh, you know, these are big body uh, type of receivers that possess, you know, not only just, uh, you know, the hands and catch radius, um, but we think about the speed and the power of these guys. That, I think that's something that people marveled at, marveled at as they saw the progression um, each and every year um, that I played in the National Football League. And I think after my third year in the league, after I made the, the catch against the Green Bay Packers, I think that instilled uh, a lot of confidence in myself that I could play and I could play on a big stage. Um, it didn't. It didn't start out particularly well, but that's where the cliche statement, uh, the, 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 the cliche, um, I guess, statement um, comes of you know it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And so for me, that mindset of just not wanting to quit, not wanting to succumb to uh, just the ebbs and flow uh, of of the game, and uh, you know disappointment, uh, having short term memory. Um, nobody's perfect. You're going to have those days. Some days you're going to have it. Some days you, you're not. And it's the great ones that look beyond that, that, that mistake and just have short term memory and go to the next that you no know, go to the next play as if the bad play just didn't happen. Um, that's where you have a small percentage of, of, of great athletes in every sport. Um, you have your average, you have your good and you have your great. And so uh, there's a little small percentage in a window uh, of athletes uh, that really go beyond, um, you know, the stratosphere of just being just good and allowing just your athletic your athletic ability and talent um, take you to where you want to. Um, athletic ability it can only take you so far. But when you think about some of the great athletes and in so many sports, and I, I I I think the perfect examples. I think 
for me, it's because I love basketball. You think about a lot of these kids, um, they go from high school to the pros. And obviously, that's not the case now. You only have you have to go one year. But just think about the kids that went go from high school to, to the pros. You think about uh, your Kevin Garnett. You think about your Kobe Bryant, uh, your LeBron James. Um, Michael Jordan, he's one of the greatest. Uh, he didn't go from uh, high school to college. I mean, high school to the pros. But he's considered, you know, obviously the greatest of, of all time. But when you think about what Michael Jordan did as setting the blueprint, especially for a guy like Kobe, he, who was a, at that point when he was alive, he was a living carbon copy of one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Uh, you think about what LeBron has done. Uh, he lived up to the expectation, lived up to the potential in which a lot of scouts and owners and GMs um, pegged him as. And so uh, that's why you look at Steph Curry. That's why you see these guys, they enhance upon their abilities and their their potential. And, then, and, and when you look at scouts and how they grade or evaluate talent, sometimes these scouts are way off base. Look at the, If you go back and look at some of the scouting reports of a guy like Steph Curry, uh, who's small frame, Another guy, Kevin Durant, they said these guys were, were not going to make it in the league. It was going to be tough. But these are some of the guys that are, I mean, they're lighting it up every night, uh, making it to uh, beyond the expectations of, you know, the playoffs, getting to the finals. Look at what Kevin Durant has done, even after the Achilles injury. Not to mention, you know, one of the greatest, uh, you know, basketball players, uh, you know, in LeBron James. Uh, look at what my, Michael Jordan did. Um, so again, when you think about these guys, um, these guys enhance their abilities. They go beyond and they exceed expectations because uh, it's that mindset of wanting to be great. Um, I think it's I think Kobe said it best, and I think a lot of athletes uh, that are you know hovering around that stratosphere of, of being great and considered one of the greatest is that it's a relentless pursuit of greatness. The most successful people in the world are the people that can self-soothe. So can you avoid being triggered? If you're being triggered and you look outward and you're angry at the person that triggered you, that's weakness. You are manifesting weakness. They are good decision makers. They are hyper resilient. They don't stop at failure. They don't get in their own way from an ego perspective. They're looking nakedly at their own inadequacies and they've got enough confidence to get people going behind them. To me, there's only one definition of success and it's entirely neurochemical based. So the goal is fulfillment, that's it. Now, the two of you have built two successful businesses. One that sold for a billion dollars, the next that's reached a billion people. What's behind that success? First of all, I'm gonna steal that. <clears throat> That's amazing. I, know, I like that. Really good. It's, it's uh, amazing. I mean, flat out amazing. Yeah. So the the only truthful answer is we run something we call the physics of progress. So I don't think of myself as being highly intelligent. I meet minimum requirements. There's no doubt. I don't want people to think I don't think I can you know get my way through life. But uh, what I'm good at and what we're good at together is not being right all the time. It's basically learning from your mistakes. So the physics of progress is you come up with a hypothesis that should be as informed as possible. You figure out a way to turn that into something you can actually do. So you're gonna run a test, then you actually run that test. And then this is where most people fall down. You have to lower your um, psychological defenses to stare nakedly at the results. And oftentimes that's gonna be, you didn't do something well, you didn't think through this right, you made a mistake somewhere. And then if you're willing to do that and you learn from that, then you can re-inform your hypothesis, make it a little bit better, run that whole system again. And once you get in that loop, then you can really make progress. But yeah, that the, the tenacity it takes to face your inadequacies and continue to try, 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 that's where we've succeeded. I mean, that sounds very scientific, right? That kind of... It's literally the scientific method recontextualized for business, 100%. No way. One of the things that's so unique about you as a couple is that collectively, you've now literally had hundreds of interviews with people who are masters at something. And when you think about patterns and, you know, after all of that intel that you've been able to uncover and explore, are, are, do you feel like there's any 
patterns, are, like, the biggest patterns that are holding people back from, from achieving their success right now? Like, what does it boil down to for you? So the people that are successful, they can self-soothe, they can stay emotionally calm in the midst of a storm. When everybody else is panicking, they're only looking at solutions. And that's the other thing about the no bullshit, what would it take game. The whole point is to switch you out of problem mode into solution mode. Most people can only see these are the 152 ways that this could go wrong. And we started doing that to say, no matter how outrageous, there is a way to pull this off. So what would need to be true for this to work? Stop telling me all the things that aren't going to work. Tell me the thing that is going to work. And once you get to that, you know, okay, well, if we did X, Y, Z, it would work. Okay, now are we willing to do that, yes or no? And if we're not, is there another thing that we are willing to do? But at least now we're operating from a position of that would work. It is this weird thing of, dude, I fear that I'm too dumb to do the things that I want to do in my life. I never know if I'm right, and I go all out every fucking time. And I'm just trying to make it happen. And so I have the courage of conviction to say, I know about myself. I will keep going until I figure this out. Not that I already understand everything, that I have the courage to figure this out. And then I will go through and I will weather that storm. People are intoxicated by that certainty, where I'm like, hey, get behind me. I will get us through this. I am not telling you I already understand everything, but I am telling you I will not stop fighting until we get to the other side. Dude, the way that people will pile in behind you when you do that, I have the chills now because I know how people respond to that. So if you can manage your emotions, if you've got the courage to fight through that storm, if you're not easy to knock off your pedestal and you're humble enough to know that you're almost certainly making mistakes so that you know when to correct course, that's the recipe. So I think this is really interesting because there, there's almost an assumption that we haven't even talked about yet. And that is, how do you define success? Like what became the thing that I want to achieve that? Or as a couple, you've been doing this, you know, you've been on this journey together. So how do you define success as a couple and individually? Life is a game of manipulating your neurochemistry. It's why I tell people the most important thing to realize is you're having a biological experience. Nature understands that to get you to do the things that nature wants you to do, which is have kids that live long enough to have kids, that the only levers that it has to pull have to do with creating desire or pain, right? So you wanna to move towards something, you wanna move away from something. And so fulfillment is the only neurochemical state that I think exists that's resilient to the ups and downs. Because if you say you just wanna be happy, so transient, right? I love eating ice cream. There are a few things that make me happier than sex with my wife and uh, eating a bowl of ice cream. Like those two are really, really peak. Hopefully and in that order. I have to think about that. <laughs> Can I do them at the same time? Uh, sure. So those things are like really peak. But if my entire life were eating ice cream and having sex, then I would get miserable. And so the irony of that, that that becomes transient, that it's not meeting some need that nature has baked into our, our hard wiring, it's like, okay, wait a second, then just pursuing happiness is not the right thing. So fulfillment, which I have a formula for, and I think this is universal, this is just based on what evolution has programmed into our brains, is you must work hard in pursuit of a set of skills that allows you to serve not only yourself, but other people. And when you do that, so we're a social animal, so you have to contribute to the group, that's just a thing. Nature had to make sure that you would get out of the cave, face a saber-toothed tiger to get fed, so you had to be willing to do hard things. Not only willing, but that if you didn't do it, you had a sense of dis-ease. So that to me is the formula. So life is ultimately about go out, do hard things that allow you to serve the group and yourself, and if you do that, you'll have a sense of fulfillment, even in the dark days when it's hard, something goes wrong and it's a major struggle, but you're like, I know why I'm doing this, right? The act of service. I'm getting better at something. Improvement, as Tony Robbins says, uh, improvement is a foundational pillar to human happiness. It's like you've got in that bundle all the things you need to meet nature's requirements and you will feel, even when it's hard, satisfied. If you could speak right into the camera and say, you know, this is my advice to you, what would you say to those 14 and 15 year olds right now? Okay, you can become anything you want to become, but you're gonna have to pay a heavy price to get there. So the question is, what is it that you wanna do? Most of you aren't gonna know the answer to that. So you're gonna go explore. As Kevin Kelly says, don't prematurely optimize. 
go experiment, go try things. Just like Lisa was saying, go play around, go enjoy yourself, figure out what it is that you like. Nothing is ever going to be self-evident. You're never gonna come across something like, this is what I meant to do with the rest of my life. You are going to find something that gives you more energy than it takes. When you find something that when you do it, you're like, ooh, this is fun, and you're actually energized by it, then you're gonna go down the path of actually gaining skills in that. The more you engage with that, if that continues to be more fun, now it will become a fascination. Once something becomes a fascination, now we're gonna really figure out if we can serve other people with that set of skills. If you can, you've got a hope of turning that into a passion. Passion is about acquiring enough skills at something that other people care about and you. You have to care about it first and foremost. But if you care about it and other people care about it, now you get into that reciprocal relationship where and it could be playing the guitar, it could be playing video games, right? Think about somebody that's just an absolute God-tier gamer, and other people will show up at a stadium to watch them play, they'll sit on Twitch for hours watching them play. So you're doing something that brings joy to other people. But they had to get freakishly good at that. They had to spend a lot of time improving their skill set. So they worked hard to gain a set of skills that allows them to serve not only themselves, but other people. That is the name of the game. The problem is people are expecting something to be self-evident. They are told a lie that they're born with a purpose. You're not born with a purpose. You're going to decide that this passion, this thing that you've worked your ass off to get good at that allows you to serve not only yourself, but other people, that's now your purpose. So when I was at Quest, my purpose was making sure that people had food that they could choose based on taste and it happened to be good for them. At Impact Theory, the goal is to give people a growth mindset at scale through story. So I'm just doing entertaining things, but it's designed to help them get that right mindset. That is my purpose. That wasn't my purpose when I was 12 or 20 or even 30. So you're going to decide and then you're gonna do things to reinforce that in your own mind. Within nine months of graduating, I entered a new world, I always say, a world of just enough. And that world was a confirmation of a belief that I had. Money could buy you love and happiness. By the time I was 30, I was knee deep in this world of just enough, just enough for me. And what I learned was because money was my God, I used to tell mom, hey, I don't believe in God. She said, oh, you believe in God. You just don't know what God you believe in. And I didn't really understand what she means. I get a little, little choked up thinking about it because at 30, I married my dream girl from the fourth grade. I'm a multimillionaire. I live in a dream house. I have dream cars, dream boats, green motorhomes. I have a ski mountain. I have a golf course, everything I ever dreamed of. But I wasn't happy. You know, you've obviously been able to now kind of look back on a life that's had highs and lows and offer fantastic advice for people. I, I now know, I think I know the most valuable gift you ever received. What's the most valuable advice you ever received? Oh, that's easy. I still receive it. Ask for help. Ask for help. That's the best advice I can give anyone. We don't live in this zero sum game. When you ask for help, everything extraordinary happens, right? We get a biochemical dose of happiness when we ask for help, when we receive help, when someone witnesses the asking and receiving of help, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins, they're injected into our system, which makes us happy. It's a proof, a biochemical proof of, hey, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing with your body, do it more. Right? So for me, it's mathematical in the way that it works. We just need to listen to what's interfering with our ease. Everyone wants to be at ease. You already are at ease. Let's figure out what's putting you at disease. And so I created four steps to do this. And I love the fact that you're picking up on, I've used all this scarce, critical business analysis, procedures and processes and systems in order to effectuate a reconciliation of hyper complex, high vibration frequency, ethereal ideas, including gratitude, forgiveness, accountability. So what do I do? I tell myself, okay, the ego is from our brain here to protect us, right? It allows us to fight for it. We flee from it. We feed it or we fornicate in order to create more of it. And so when I know the ego's purpose, my life becomes easier. What do I mean? The ego is necessary. Bro. That's a long drop down there. Our ego tells us if you and I went down there right now and I said, hey, let's jump down on the rocks. Our ego would say, run, don't do it. Not a chance. No chance. The ego also will get you up, get you back up, get you started and get you back started. So it was my ego when I lied in bed that one day 
after thinking, I gotta go tell my mom I lost everything, including her house, it was my ego that said, if you can look up, you can get up. It's, it's that fear, right, that allows you to get up, get back up, but fear uses about 90% of your fuel to get you up. So we wanna limit the amount of fear that we use because eventually we need inspiration. We need to access the power we're given, not create power or acceleration with fear. So understanding ego, it, knowing it edges goodness out of our life, it edges gold out of our life, it edges God out of our life, whatever you think it does, but it will fuel us real quick to get up, get back up, get started. Now here's the interesting thing. I need to be an expert at identifying fear. It's the greatest practice I feel if you have faith and believe in what I'm talking about to utilize energy in its correct manner. Why is that? So if I can identify fear, I can use it to get up, back up when I get knocked out or knocked down. And there's some great lines from great boxers about that, like Mike Tyson, right? Never know what you're going to do to get punched in the face. Or These are all people who understand fear at its core, how to utilize it to get up and get back up. But what I find the more powerful use of fear is just to identify it so you don't resist it. You don't try to fight it, go over it, under it, through it, around it. You don't have to lie to it, manipulate it, and cheat it. You don't have to deny it. Simply practice identify when you have a need to be right, or a need to be offended, or a need to be separate, or inferior, or superior. How about just anxious, frustrated, guilty, resentful, or angry? If we can identify when we feel the ego, intuitively how the ego is interfering with our ease, and instead of resisting it, just stop. Sounds easy, but if you can stop and then breathe through your nose, out through your mouth, drop down to center, drop into the flow, drop into ease. Remind, remember, and recollect the source. Remind with, recollect with, remember with the source. The all-knowing, the all-powerful, the omniscient, the omnipresent that loves you more than your mom. If you can do that, stopping and dropping, you now can roll into what you want today. Who you can help and who can help you, how best to get that done. Reprioritize applying your why in a trajectory to the unlimited, infinite possibilities and probabilities of the future in a trajectory of probably what you think you want but will receive even bigger and better faster. So utilizing the ego as a point of understanding of do I need to use the ego for this or am I identifying the ego so I can stop, drop and roll knowing that the ego puts our mind, body and soul on fire to get us up, get us back up. But on the inspiration side, when your mind, body, soul and on fire, you're interfering with your true power. So when you're on fire, what do you do? Stop, drop and roll. This is the secret to what I teach in a very methodical way to increase the flow of the truth, your potential, love, light, and lessons that allow you to do whatever you dream of or even better. I mean, you brought it up a couple of times, laying on your bed, thinking I gotta call my mom to tell her she's gonna lose her home. And so I, I, as you're talking, I, I can my brain gets it, but I'm also recognizing that you were deep in emotion. And that's, you know, you could be spiraling in all sorts of ways. But somehow, again, you said, if I can look up, I can get up. How did you go from, I mean, an emotional, whatever, I'm, it was at the lowest point? So the lowest point was my wife was gonna leave me. That's the lowest, two years earlier. The second lowest when reality hits, right? Because now, cause and effect become one. Problems and solutions become one. See, an interval of time is defined by two moments a cause and an outcome or a cause. This is how we define pragmatically time. The biggest misuse of time, problems and solution. Recognition or acknowledgement occurs at these moments. So there was acknowledgement when my wife was gonna leave me, serious fear and pain, but the reality that she was right and there was nothing I could do about the causes I created. So I'd already learned the lessons, I was practicing them, but there's still that reality of, oh my gosh, I'm went from owning 33 homes in San Diego alone to a rented house, rented furniture, a pregnant wife with three daughters under 10. What am I gonna do? And I gotta tell my mom she's moving. I have really messed this up. And in some respects, I was more equipped, but in others, it was like, okay, I already got the lessons. Why are you punishing me? And when I lay there in bed that day of filing bankruptcy, <laughs> and keeping it secret, because I wasn't the person that I am today. I illuminate all my shit. 
right? I, I am who I am. You're either going to love me for who I am, but you're not going to, literally, you're not going to love me for who I'm not. Right? You can hate me for who I am, but you're not going to love me for who I'm not. I am. I'm going to tell you the truth and illuminate to the best of my ability, spend minutes and moments outside of the truth, minutes and moments in ego-based consciousness. That's the secret sauce of what I do. But when I lied there in bed, it was another coincidence because tears were rolling down my face. I could not lift up my arms, right? It's, it's harder almost because I knew the lessons. It wasn't like I was in that ignorant arrogance where I was in blame, shame, and justification. I was lying there being accountable and that's hard. And I got out of bed, I took a shower, I put on my clothes, I walked over to my mom's house crying, I rang the doorbell and she answered and I thought it was gonna be the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And she looked at me and she's like, what's the matter? Is everybody okay? I said, mom, I lost everything. I lost your house, you need to move. Are you okay? Are you okay? No, mom, I don't think you heard me. You have to move, I lost it. I heard you, are you okay? Do you need some money? What can I do for you? What I had built up in my mind turned into the biggest of all lessons, the witness of unconditional love. That here's my mom who told me my whole life I was lost serving the wrong God. Arrogantly, I'm thinking, I make more money in one day than you made in a lifetime. And there was her showing me the path of unconditional love, teaching me that none of it mattered, that she loved me. She was here to protect and promote me. No matter what mistakes, pain, failures, and setbacks I was gonna have, even if it implicated her into them, that she was there promoting and protecting me. And my faith, knowing that there's something even bigger than my mom that loves me more than her, has propelled me and promoted me and protected me to a place that most people dream of in their lives, and I'm living it. I know people are watching this right now, and their back's on the mat, their back's on the bed. If, if, I mean, if you could literally look into that camera and talk to somebody who's in that spot, what would you say to somebody? I mean, you've gone through it, they'll listen. Yeah, well, first of all, look up and then breathe. Think about what you want. Think about how you can help and who can help you. And then start thinking about how. And then prioritize that very first step. Prioritize that very first day. Start thinking about what you want and continue every day enjoying that consistently, persistently in the pursuit of your potential. Also, have an open mind. Remember, I talk about what I think I want in the future. I'm open to learning and changing my mind. I love fast learners and I love hypocrites. And so if you feel that way, look up and then think about what you want, who you can help and who can help you, how best to get that done. I promise you each day will become easier. It'll aggregate upon itself and pretty soon you too will be an overnight success. You've got some 20 year olds in your house. You've got a good sense of what 20 year olds are going through right yeah. now. We've got a lot of 20 year olds who watch this show. I mean, there's a lot of pressures going in their world right now. And it's a different world than probably the world that you and I grew up in. You know, if you think about the 20 year olds that you're closest to, what's your advice to 20 year olds right now? Besides ask for help, find someone who sits in a position that you want to be in, the fastest way to get to where you want to be, find someone that's already there and ask them for help. You would be amazed how many older successful people want to help. So don't talk yourself out of asking for help. But also one of my favorite ones is show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I see so many people surrounding themselves. See, your frequency is your neighborhood. And let me explain what that means is your frequency is created by your neighbors. And if you're sitting in the projects on a lawn chair drinking a Colt 45, you may have all the skills in the world, all the knowledge in the world, all the desire in the world. And when you turn to your buddy on the lawn chair drinking and you say, hey, can you help me? How many options, opportunities and touches of favor do you think someone in your neighborhood is going to be able to give you? I'm telling you, frequency and vibration wise, surround yourself with the right people and the right ideas. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Surround yourself with people that are going to give you more options, more opportunities, and more touches of favor. Surround yourself with people that feed you. So many people are being bled. 80% of their time is around people that make them feel like crap. They're watching things that make them feel like crap. They're listening to things that make them feel like crap. They're surrounding themselves with people that make themselves feel with crap. They're being bled all day long and wonder why they feel bled. 
Take my advice, ask for help, surround yourself with people that feed you and feed them. It'll be amazing the difference in your life. I always tell like my friends, my family, or anyone that I'm mentoring is that it's about beating the tired man. Like don't let the tired man beat you. I dealt with homelessness and poverty growing up, domestic violence, growing up in a home with a lot of drug abuse and alcoholism. But I had that vision of going to the Olympics and I had that that skill of jumping, I put those two things together and it was really the thing that pulled me through those difficult times. And I think that when people have those difficult times, you have to have something that is that brings hope and joy and, and has the power to propel you through difficult situations because each and every one of us has them. A lot of times just putting your feet on the ground and taking those steps is the hardest part. And so if you can get past that, usually if you have it written down, you can, get, you can beat the tired man, then you'll finally start building those habits where you could continuously work towards your goals. So you've been to four Olympics. You're preparing for 2020. 2019, you get a devastating diagnosis and, and it changes your world. Can you let us know about what that diagnosis was? Yes, so in 2018, I found an itsy bitsy tiny rice sized lump from doing a self breast exam. And the reason why I even decided to, to do self breast exams, I was only 34, 34 at the time, um, was because a, another athlete shared her story and her journey with breast cancer. So I really wanted to be proactive. Unfortunately, when I went to the doctor, I was dismissed and I was told not to come back for six years and that what I was experiencing was a swollen lymph node. Well, the doctor was completely wrong. Um, it turned out to be breast cancer, a very aggressive, fast-growing form of breast cancer that predominantly impacts African-American women. And when I started learning the statistics about breast cancer and how impactful it is that it could be as much as one in eight here within the States that will be impacted with breast cancer in their lifetime, I was shocked and I was devastated. And you know, being a mother that I thought that I had my whole life in front of me now facing a diagnosis where I could die soon, um, my heart broke. But I realized that that tenacity that was built over years of watching the Olympics, enduring poverty, enduring domestic violence, figuring out ways to come back from pregnancy to be at the top of the world, to break American records, I could take that same mindset and mental state and apply it to this breast cancer journey. And I started making a list of all of the things that I did to become successful as an athlete. But before that, I said, no. I decided that I was going to be defiant and that I wanted to live and that my life was worth fighting for. And so, you know, I, I did the same things. You, when you're an athlete, you look for a great coach, you look for a great nutritional plan, you look for, you know, a great training program. I did the same thing. I looked for an amazing oncologist, amazing um, surgeon. I looked for an amazing medical team so that I could make sure that I could be here and watch my kids grow up. I wonder if you look back again, the, the, the hindsight is 2020 idea. If, if you think back to yourself at 20 years old, now living the life you've lived, showing the perseverance that you have, the tenacity that you have, four Olympic games, doing it while giving birth, fighting through cancer, changing your platform to now taking on a different kind of fight. What would you tell yourself as a 20 year old? To not worry so much. I worried so much and paid so much attention to things that were not important. Um, family, love, friendships, experiences, and being able to be of service to one another. I would continue to tell myself to have faith, never, never, not for one second to give up faith, because everything works out exactly the way that it's supposed to. I think that those are the bits of information that would have kept me from a lot of days of crying and fighting with myself and, and being upset because in the end it always worked out. There's a lot of 20 year olds listening to this. <laughs> I hope that message reaches, there's a lot of 41 year olds listening to this. I, I hope that message reaches me too. What's the greatest advice you've ever received, Shante? Oh, that's a hard one. That's a really good question. Um, 
You know what, it's funny. Um, it was an older lady who told me not to make mountains out of molehills. And I think sometimes we have this situation right in front of us and it seems so big and so earth shadowing and our earth shattering. And we feel it's just a huge stumbling block um, of us being who we want to be or being a contributor to the society as a whole. And I think that if we, we stop making small, minute issues into monumentous mountains in our life, we will live a more fulfilled, more happy life. And so that is the best advice I had ever received. And the second one, that excuses are the patches that we sew on the garment of failure. Yeah, so both of those. <laughs> I like it. I'll take it. <laughs> well, if you think back to your career, I mean, as long as it's been over, you know, that level of competition at that at that height, uh, what was the highest moment? What was the lowest moment? Okay, I'm gonna start with the highest moment. The highest moment was when I was receiving my Olympic medal, and. It was something that I had faith for for a long time. It was something I believed would never happen. So immediately after going to the 2016 Olympics, I was the last jumper. If I make the bar, I'm Olympic gold medalist. If I miss it, you know, I'm fourth place. It was just first place loser. You know, sorry to all you guys out there that are living in fourth place world. <laughs> but um, getting that Olympic medal, going to the Olympic ceremony from 2008 and having that medal handed to my three-year-old son who handed it to my five-year-old daughter, who gave it to my nine-year-old daughter, who gave it to my husband, who placed it around my neck. That was literally the highest moment of my athletic career. I think that my lowest moment was being told those words, you have cancer. And, you know, just feeling so strong and so untouchable, like I was the one who believed that pain is weakness leaving the body. And I felt like Wonder Woman and just to see my son afraid to hug me because he thought that he would break me, that was probably my lowest moment. And being able to come back from that to where I am now, um, post-athletic, I am living in my highest moment yet again. That's amazing. Shante, what do you think your legacy is? I would hope that my legacy is bringing hope to the hopeless. Especially now more than ever, we see that people are losing hope and they can't see beyond their current circumstances and they feel like, like their runway is too short. But um, I want to bring the fact that there is hope. There was a time period in my life where I decided that I didn't want to live anymore. And that was at that 20 year old age. That's why it was so easy for me to go back there and say, you know, and it was something dumb. It was a breakup. <laughs> and just to see all the amazing and beautiful things that were waiting for me in life on the other side of that moment. I want people that are living in their 20 year old devastation to know that there's life on the other side of it and to hold on to hope. Like if she could do it, I could do it. If, if there were great things in her life after all she's went through, I could make it too. So that's my, I hope that's my legacy. Shante, you think about, the, you, you speak to this legacy of providing hope to the hopeless. You know, there are people watching right now that are feeling hopeless. What would be your message directly to that person who needs to hear it in this moment? So to you, to the person who's feeling like there's no hope, that you can't see a way out of your current situation or circumstance, I want to say first that I'm sorry that you're going through whatever trial it is that you're going through right now. It's not fair and you don't deserve it. But there is hope on the other side of this trial. I want you to think about those feelings, those times where you felt happiness, where you felt joy, where you experienced love in a way that you never thought you'd be able to experience. And I want you to hold on to those moments and think about your future and think about having those moments of love and joy and laughter and peace again. And I want you to know that right now, it's just a trial. It's just a test. 
the things that seem to hurt you and make you feel like you can't put one step in front of the other, it's just something that's going to happen to make you stronger. You don't have to get from how you're feeling right now to immediate joy and laughter. It might take time. But all I'm asking you to do is put one foot in front of the other and grasp onto that hope with everything that you have and know that this too shall pass. Everybody experiences regret. Regret makes us human. Regret is part of the human condition. We think that regret makes us weaker when in fact the research shows that regret can make us stronger, that we can enlist our regrets as a, an engine for forward progress. Because as I had you know, collected 16,000 regrets from people in 105 countries. And when they told me their regrets, in a sense, they were also telling me about what made life worth living. You know, regrets are part of the human condition. They exist for a reason. They're part of our cognitive machinery. The only people without regrets are five-year-olds, people with brain damage and sociopaths. The rest of us <laughs> have regrets, you know? And so instead of, instead of denying that humanity, let's embrace it and use it. So I think one of the things with regret is that the reason I, we, a lot of people run from them is that they hurt, right? Like there's something about it that feels like this was a negative. This is a, this is a, a psychological landmark of things that didn't go the way I hoped to, or I would have done it differently. How do I turn that? Like, how do I take something that feels like it hurts and turn it into progress? It's, it's a really good point. And this is important. And it, 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 in some ways, it's central. Regret hurts. There's no question about that. But here's the thing. Regret also instructs. And you can't have one without the other. So what you have to do is, so if you avoid the pain, you don't get any of the learning. So what you have to do is be able to process that pain. And I think there's a way for us to do that, to take our regrets, use them as signals. We haven't been taught to do that. That's the problem. We have this weird approach. We have this weird view of negative emotions. Like some of us think, oh, positive all the time. Da, da, da. That leads to delusion. Some of us get so absorbed in our negative emotions that they, in some ways, exonerate us from making progress. That's a bad idea, too. What we need to do is we need to process our negative emotions in a, in a, in a systematic way. And I, and I think there's a good way to do that. And when you, so I understand with the book, um, you had 16,000 people send you their regrets. I, you know, in certain ways that it feels like a really fascinating study. In certain ways, it must have been really heavy to read all of that. You know, to actually hear people's thought, like, what did I regret in life that I'd be willing enough to kind of send into somebody? Yeah. Any, I mean, A, did it feel emotional and B, were there any stories that stood out to you that feel like really um, kind of almost symbolize the, the power of regret? Sure. I mean, you know, it's interesting. It's an interesting question uh, because when I had is I had this giant database of, of, of regrets and I would look on my computer screen and see them listed there. And you know what? It wasn't that much of a downer because hmm. I felt like people were, for, for a whole host of reasons, I felt like people were trying to make sense of it. That is, that is, you know, one of the things that we... There's some interesting research on this. One of the things that we, th we, we think about disclosure of our vulnerabilities and our setbacks and so forth is that people will like us less. And in fact, they actually like us more when we do that. And so I actually had a lot of respect for people willing to disclose and willing to explain. And I felt like I was actually helping them make sense of this regret. So it wasn't that much of a downer. The other thing about it, to, to the second part of your question, which is this, is that over and over and over again, in among these 16,000 regrets, people kept talking about the same four core regrets over and over and over again around the world, the same four regrets kept coming up. And I found that fascinating because there wasn't much national difference. What's more, as I said earlier, these four regrets are revealing because by telling me, by, by telling us, by, by revealing our regrets, we are revealing what we value the most. And so to me, these four core regrets operate as a photographic negative of the good life. That is, if we understand what people regret the most, we actually understand what they value the most. So in a weird way, these 16,000 regrets are not a downer as much as they are a pointer to 
what makes life worth living. Interesting. I mean, even I'm even hearing the you know the bias in my question, right? Assuming that these regrets coming to you would have been this like heavy hit, whereas in lots of ways it sounds like it was almost by the nature of somebody writing them down and sending them in, they're now processing them, which is showing the progress that they're hoping to make, or at least kind of like lighting the path down that direction. Sure, sure, sure. And also, just they're they're interesting. Anytime anybody tells you a story, it's in, you know you're 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 yeah. interested yeah. in it, and and you and you and as a human being, you empathize with it, and. And you also see yourself in that. And, and, and in some ways, they were reassuring. So people came to me and said, you know what? I have a regret that I wasn't kind enough to people earlier in my life. I look at that and say, golly, you know what? I have that same regret. And it sort of made me feel a little bit better to know that other people had that regret. Are you willing to tell us what are the four regrets? Sure thing. Uh, so there are, there are four core regrets over and over again, and they, they, they tend to transcend the domains of life. We often think of our regrets as like, oh, I have a career regret. Oh, no, but I have a health regret or I have a romance regret. But what I found is the four regrets are these foundation regrets. Foundation regrets are if only I'd done the work. These are regrets people have about not studying hard enough in university or um, not taking care of their health or smoking or not eating right or not saving money. Small decisions that accumulate to bad consequences. The second one, huge category, boldness regrets. These are regrets that people have that say, if only I'd taken the chance. They didn't start a business. They didn't ask that crush out for a date. They didn't travel. Uh, they had an opportunity at, at one point in their life to do something beyond play it safe. They chose not to do that and now they regret it. Third category are moral regrets. If only I'd done the right thing. These are people who at a certain point in their life could do the right thing or the wrong thing. They do the wrong thing and it still bugs them, which is in some way, its own way heartening. It shows that I think people want to be good. And the final one are connection regrets. Connection regrets are if only I'd reached out. I and mean, these are regrets about relationships um, where you have a relationship or you should have had a relationship and it comes apart usually through drifts and you want to reach out but you don't because you think it's going to be awkward and the other side's not going to care so it drifts out even more and then in in some cases it, it ends up being too late and so these four regrets to me reveal as i said earlier what makes life worth living what do we want out of life we want a stable foundation we want some stability we want a chance to do something we want a chance to learn and grow and lead a psychologically rich life we want to do the right thing. I'm convinced, Tyler, that most of us want to do the right thing. And what else do we want? We want love. We want connection to other people. That's what makes life worth living. And I think in terms of careers, I think that's what, what makes a good career. I think that what makes, that's what makes an organization that's worth working for. So, so if I'm a, you know, a listener and I'm sitting here thinking, you know, there is a connection regret that I have. You know, I... I should reach out to that person. And there's probably a reason why I, I haven't. I mean, there's there's something that's that's blocking it. Yeah. What would you suggest I do? Like what what's the what unlocks that for somebody? Okay, really, really, really important. Okay, so I think the two barriers are this. You think it's gonna feel awkward, and you think the other side is not gonna care. And here's the reality, both the reality of all these people I interviewed, but also the reality of a lot of research in social science. It's much less awkward than you think. <laughs> Two, the other side almost always cares. You're just wrong about that. And one of the things that I, one of the things that I did, I mean, I have a scene in the book where I talk to somebody who's saying, "Oh, I lost this. I, I, I drifted apart from this friend, and I'm not sure I would, I should reach out. And if I reach out, she's going to think it's creepy." And I finally said, "Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. How would you feel if she reached out to you?" And she said, "Oh my God, that would be the greatest thing. I'd be so touched." And I'm like, "Well." Hello, like, you know, extrapolate from your own experience there. And, and so, and so I really believe if there's a lesson in this book, it's certainly the lesson for me is that if you are at that juncture that you described, should I reach out or should I not reach out? You've already answered the question. Uh, I, I think the lesson is always reach out. Well, I, I mean, I like it with, it feels like with regret, you're just diving straight in. It's like, you know, this, this could be awkward. This could be lots of things. Step into it. It sounds like that's one of the kind of core themes. Is that is that fair to say? Uh, it's basically yes, yes. Because there's a there's a third way. Don't ignore it. Don't dodge it. 
just confront it. It's much less fearsome than you think. And this way that I think that we can process our regrets is very healthy. So one thing you can do is you can, ref you know, like I, I feel like there's three simple steps that you can take to turn your regrets into engines for progress. One of them yeah, is, please. To is to reframe the regret and the way you think about yourself. Um, so, you know, do you, so a lot of times when we have a regret, one reason that we try to avoid it is that if we really confront it, we start lacerating ourselves saying, you, you know, our, our self-talk is you're an idiot. What are you talking about? Um, and what we should do instead is it sounds gooey, but what we should do instead is treat ourselves with kindness. There's a body of research in what's called self-compassion, which is treating ourselves with kindness rather than contempt. Um, thinking about our own missteps as part of the human condition, not something that only we do. Um, looking at our missteps not as fully definitional of who we are, but as just one part of who we are. And so just sort of being a little better to ourselves. The second thing you can do, which we see, which is a reason why we had 16,000 people offer up their regrets, is disclosure. Disclosure is itself inherently valuable. And we know that it relieves a burden. But the other thing, when we talk about our regrets or even write about them, we take this blobby, amorphous, negative emotion and convert it into words. And that makes it less fearsome. And it begins the sense-making process. So there's a pile of evidence showing that talking about our regrets, even writing about them privately, is a way to defang them. And finally, what we need to do, which is essential, is we need to you know, we can, we can look inward, all right? We can express outward, but then we gotta, we gotta move forward. And the way to do that, in my mind, is to take a step back and extract a lesson from it. Uh, what would you tell your best friend to do? Uh, if, you, if you were looking back on this decision 10 years from now, what would you want to have done? If someone else were in your position, what would she do? And, and I think this process of looking inward and treating ourselves with some kindness, expressing outward and disclosing the regret as a way to make sense of it, and then moving forward by taking a step back and extracting a lesson is relatively simple to do and allows us to take these regrets and not be scared of them and not let them debilitate us, but to enlist them as forces for moving forward. Hmm. So it's self-compassion to write it down, really make you write it down, tell somebody, make sense of it. That kind of put a package around it, understand it as opposed to just this kind of blob, and then and then try to figure out the lesson from it so you can move forward. Reframe it by treating yourself with kindness through self-compassion, disclose it to make sense of it, and um, take a step back and extract a lesson from it that you can apply to next time. And that bothered me that people were trying to fix something deeply emotional, which was I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, so I need to be thinner, smarter, more attractive, I need to go to the gym to change this bit, but it's this bit you have to change. And the only thing wrong with you is you don't think you're good enough, and that's a belief, and here's how it works. You think a thought, and the thought makes you feel a feeling. And the feeling makes you behave in a certain way, which you justify because you think the thought. So don't worry about changing the behavior, or indeed the feeling changed the thought. What do you think it is about what you see that has people listen? I think it's hard for me to wrap my head around it too. But I think people want someone to simplify the workings of the mind. You know, we're all taught by teaches that the mind is very complex and it takes a lifetime to understand it and a lifetime to apply it. And that simply isn't true. When you understand the workings of the mind, it's not complicated at all. So I always wanted to make make stuff simple. You know, you can change like that. Can you change in 21 days? You can change in 21 seconds if you know how. In fact, you can change twice every day, first in the way you think and the second in the way you act. So I think, I, I believe it's the fact that I've made it simple. Everything I talk about, that the, the strength is in the simplicity and the honesty. There's no need to complicate stuff. People want some simple, but they also want it to be fast. We live in such a fast world. And if you can't give your message like really fast, people are just not interested. And I get that. Has it always been simple for you? Or did you have to go through some kind of transformation yourself where things just became clearer? No, it's always been simple for me. I think getting other people who are very invested, it's long, it's complicated, it's complex. So for instance, a lot of people I work with will say, I've got OCD or I've got anorexia or I've got anxiety. 
and that's very complex, so the treatment must be complex, and that doesn't have to be the case. It can be, but it also can't be. So it's always been simple for me, but getting other people to, um, to buy into the simplicity was probably challenging at times. I read that you knew your purpose in life in 1984. I don't know how many people have it on a calendar like that yeah. where it just becomes that clear. I mean, one of our big channels, Motivation to Study, one of the big questions we get from people is, how do I discover my life yeah. purpose? And I'm feeling a lot of pressure for it and I actually just don't know mm. how it works. So what is your purpose and, and how did you discover it? My purpose, I would say, is to give people freedom and empowerment from their issues and their pain. That, that would be my purpose and that would, would be what gives me meaning in life. And I think you know what your purpose is because when you're doing it, it feels so right. When I'm on stage talking, it's not scary. I absolutely love it. In fact, it energizes me. When I'm working with clients in my office, I never find it draining. I find it invigorating. And I think that's the thing. When you do what you love and you love what you do, first of all, you feel like you never work. But secondly, it inspires you. It motivates you. And if I do what I don't love, I, I feel the difference immediately. And so we all have a gift, and I think your challenge is find out what you love to do and become brilliant at it. And, and we've all got something unique that we can do. So I guess in 1984, when I was training in hypnotherapy, I knew immediately, oh, this is me, and this is me for the rest of my life. I knew that that was my purpose, that was my meaning, that was my passion. And, and of course, the second wonderful thing is that when you do what you love, it gives you every bit as much as you give other people. Like I was speaking here this week and was saying, oh my God, it's so amazing what you gave me. I said, well, what you gave me it was also amazing because you were receptive and you liked it. And so it's a great thing about giving and receiving, giving energy and receiving it back. So for the 20 year old who's listening, who's, who's wanting that so desperately, they're wanting to, to feel that energy, to feel like this is me, I want to get good at it, but they're not finding that yet. Would you tell them to be patient or is there a different way they could start to search? What would be your thoughts for that 20-year-old? Yeah, you know, when I was 20, I was very clear I was going to be a school teacher. My father wanted me to do that. He told me it was a wonderful job. He was a school teacher. I was going there. I was going to teach a training college and I was going to be a school teacher. And somewhere in that teacher training college, I thought, you know, I don't want to be a teacher. I'd actually like to be a child psychologist. So I began to switch my training. And then I realized again, actually, no, I don't want to do that either. Because when you work with children as a therapist, you always have three patients, mum, dad, and child. And so I was going there. But in fact, I went there and I went there. I, I became a therapist. I wrote books. I began to work on television shows. And then I created my own method. And so actually, I became a teacher after all. But it was a go over here and then go back. And I think at 20, you very rarely know what you want to do. And if you do, that's not always a good thing. Because I work with many people in their 40s who say, you know, all my life I've been a lawyer an accountant, and I've realized I didn't even want to do that. It doesn't make my heart sing. But it's very hard to know at 20 what you're meant to do. So give yourself a break. Find out what you love. Find out what makes your heart sing. In fact, one of the major causes of depression is failing to follow your heart's desire. And we're so into, well, this is a good career and this has good benefits and the salary is good. And we think, but I don't, I don't love it. I recently trained a police officer to be a therapist who said, I went into the police force to make a difference and discovered I was just locking up alcoholics and drug addicts every night. And it was very demoralizing. And now I'm a therapist and here I am making a difference. So be open. Don't put any pressure on yourself. Just find out what you love and when you do what you love you'll feel like you never really work a day in your life i mean i work very hard but i also feel like i never really work and that's a great thing two milestones 1984 discover your life purpose today 25 million people a week can you fill in the career trajectory between those two points it's a big question so 1984 i just i was actually i'd gone to college i left college i moved to la i became a personal trainer for jane fonda which i loved but i was fascinated by the psychology of bulimia and anorexia and orthorexia and body dysmorphia which i saw in my classes all the time it, it led me into my 
I'm enough movement because I realize that people with eating disorders and compulsive shopping and hoarding and drinking and addictions all had the same thing. I'm not enough, the core. I've worked with thousands of addicts. I've never met one ever who said, I'm good enough, I'm worthy enough, and I just drink for fun. They drink because of the emptiness inside. And the emptiness is the needs that were not met as children that they're still trying to fill. And so in 1984, I, I saw many things that fascinated me and, and were all to do with this feeling of not enoughness. And so in 1984, I began to research the psychology of eating disorders, the psychology of not enoughness, the psych what lies behind addictions. And over maybe four years, I developed my own method of therapy and clients would come in and say things like, oh, you know, when you said that one thing or did that one thing, that was a game changer. But often they'd say something different. So I began to collate all the things that really worked for clients because therapy is not about the therapist. It's about the client, what's wrong, what happened. And I realized that to be really good, you have to do three things at the same time. You have to become what I call a detective, a good detective. A good detective lays out pictures and they look at them and then they try to work out what's happened in this scene. So I'd be looking at information and working out with the client, not for them. How did you become anorexic? How did you become bulimic? When did you become a hoarder? What happened when you began to have these issues? I never say what's wrong with you. I never even say, how are you feeling? I always say, what happened? What happened to you? Let's track back like a detective. When you're 11, you suddenly developed an eating disorder. When you were 12, you suddenly got contact dermatitis. What was going on in that moment? And after you've got that information, which is very easy to get when you ask the right questions, the next thing is to become more like a dentist than a detective and you start removing all those toxic beliefs. Look, just because your dad never saw you, just because you were the fifth girl and you should have been a boy, that's not you, you're meant to be you. So I, I would then, so it's like a detective gathering information, a dentist extracting all the toxic stuff and then you become a coder and you code in and wire in and fire in better beliefs rather like if my computer started to slow down, I'd get an excellent, you go, it's got a bug in it. I'm going to upgrade your software. But we have a bug in us, so we need to upgrade our software. And then in doing that, I realized that really all of my clients could only have one of three things wrong with them. And that would be a billionaire, an Olympic athlete, or maybe a school teacher, or maybe a, an unhappy teenager that was desperately depressed. And the three things are always I'm not enough. That's the huge thing. I'm not enough. And if you start from I'm not enough, then you need more. More cake, more drinks, more drugs, more sex, more stuff, more shopping, more followers, <clears throat> because we've got so into I'm not enough and I need more. And it's actually very easy to fix that, which is why I have all these I'm enough bracelets and mm. I have an I'm enough movement and we've got it in schools now and it's making a profound difference. The next thing wrong is what I want isn't available. I want love, but I'm not lovable. I want success, but I didn't go to college. I want to be free of depression, but I've got the depression gene or the alcoholic gene. I'm not really convinced they even exist, but the belief that I want something so much and I'm going after it, but it's not available. It's this block, these blocking thoughts, these limiting beliefs. And the third one is I'm different, so I can't connect. And that sounds silly, but it's actually the bane of people's lives because we're tribal people, wired to connect, wired to belong, wired to find connection, and avoid rejection. But we live in a world now where we connect with our screen and we connect with our phone and it's really damaging people. So I find with all my clients and with, I've trained 15,000 people now to be our TT therapists or coaches, and I would say, look, don't make it complicated. Look for those three things. You'll find them. And when you look for those, it can only be one of those three things or degrees of it. It just makes life so simple because clients love it when you say, look, I know we're talking about the addiction to alcohol 
on the addiction to drugs and the self-sabotage and the procrastination, but really, the only thing wrong with you is you don't think you're good enough. The law of control says it all starts with a thought. But changing your thoughts is easy, it's free, it can be instant. And so I really like to simplify what makes humans tick because what's the point of making it complicated? How does that help anyone who says, well, I'm messed up and so hard to change and people can't change. It's like, well, that's not correct. Who taught you that? You, from the minute you're born, you're changing. Oh, you know, it's, it's long and arduous to recover. No, it isn't. Some people recover like that. Some people don't, but you could be one of the ones that changes your thoughts, changes your feelings, changes your actions after all. I'm the number one go-to guy in the world of celebrities. How do you make that happen? You really don't. I think I just work so hard at my skill set. There's actually a scripture in the Bible that says, do you see a man skilled at his work? He will serve in the presence of kings. And so I just decided to get very skilled at my work. And anywhere from working from little kids in orphanages to people in prisons to Robert Downey Jr. So I don't see anybody as different I just see them as human beings that need to turn a setback to a comeback. Think about that idea from a setback to a comeback. One of the names I've heard you bring up a couple of times is Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. You know, for those who've been kind of following his career for a couple of decades, would have seen probably that full circle. So are those the steps that you walk through with somebody like him? And what was that like? when you were first called by him, like what was that moment like? Yeah, I think number one, Robert and I are just, we're friends. And, and I see Robert as a friend that we've had great conversations. And uh, Robert was nice enough to include me in his life, um, in all parts of his life, in his wins and in his challenging days. I've included him in my life. He even used to go to my son's basketball games. So Robert is just a friend. Um, so I would say that with anybody that I'm dealing with, I take them through those steps. You gotta wake up, take inventory, partner with the right people. Now, when you partner with the right people, that means you're gonna probably have to eliminate some people that are not the right people. Hmm. And this is what I see with a lot of people that are in a setback. They need to cut some people back. And I say this about the power partnership. You have the acquaintance, which is the person of, we just know each other. Secondly, you have the partner that's more intimate. And then the third level is what I call the green room. The green room is that place that you go to that you are allowed to invite who you want in that green room. But they better be people of power, people of substance, people of a similar mindset and a mood set and motives that really strengthen you. So you gotta have the right people in that green room. So I mean, that just brings it really clear for me, that idea of a green room, who you're inviting in. Do you find that people ever get confused with who they've got in that room and they're trying to tell you, oh no, it's the right person, but you've got maybe some other questions about whether that person is the right choice for that room. Like how do you get somebody leveled? Mostly it's, green it's not the right okay. person. And I'll tell you why, because, um, when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. <laughs> Interesting spiral there, isn't it? Yeah, when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. So if I'm dealing with a, a, a famous actor, and I deal with so many, I have over 300 entertainers I work with. Wow. Is that, you know, like I think of a guy six months ago, like Tim, these guys are fantastic. No, not so much. <laughs> because when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. So I don't ever come at them like too strong unless I have to. But I say, why don't you just take some time off from these people? And as you are getting healed, then start to see, do we want to reinvite them into our green room? Usually they do not. But put them in the first place, put them in the second place but that doesn't mean they need to be in your inner circle. You're now called by some of the people that we watch daily, you yeah. know, or, or see daily, and oftentimes in a highly pressurized situation. How did you start to become, 
how did you start to have conversations that were life-changing for those people? Yeah, I think that um, for me, it was about getting educated and having great conversations with people about, about life. I just began to grow. So I, I continued to go on in my education. I ended up getting a, a doctorate in world religion. But while I was studying that subject, uh, I started studying a lot of classes on counseling, crisis counseling. And then at an early age, early 20s, I started working with what's known as the NFL, because we have people watching from all over the world, sure. National Football League. And um, a lot of the stars of the NFL started asking me in that day for my home number. We didn't have cell phones. And I started life coaching them before anybody knew what life coaching was. This is, this is like in the late 80s. No kidding. I was talking to the guys of like the Tim Browns. I was talking to the Deion Sanders. I was talking to the, the, the greatest stars in the, in the NFL. Uh, so from that, I then had to find a way to educate myself more, even though I had my doctorate that I was working on at the time. So I went to a famous uh, lady who taught at USC, University of Southern California, in psychology. And she goes, Tim Story, I love you. I am going to help you. And she gave me this huge manual on how to work with people. And I love to study. So I just began to study this. She began to mentor me and tutor me for about 15 years. And then, you know, athletes, no entertainers, entertainers, no athletes. And then it turned into this thing that we see today. Now, I heard a story you were mentioning a little while ago. You were in Oprah's backyard casually one day and you were talking about a concept that you've talked about before, working your ground, and she was yes. getting excited by this. Can you tell us a bit about that story? Yeah, first of all, it's nice to be in Oprah's backyard a lot. <laughs> but we like to share concept with each other, Oprah and I, and she loves this idea about the law of the harvest. You know, a lot of people, they just think about manifesting something, but in the law of the harvest, I teach you gotta plow the ground, you gotta plant the right seed, then you got to water the seed, which is repetition, and then you'll reap the harvest. And I feel that some people, they get really frustrated in the plowing, the planting, and the watering, but they don't realize that payday's on its way. So she loves that story. I mean, she must have planted the right seeds. She really did. But if you go back into her uh, life, even when she was working in the early days for different small towns and working in the news, she was doing a lot of plowing, mm -hmm. a lot of planting, mm -hmm. a lot of watering. And then later on, the King brothers came and uh, helped her get her own show. And then the rest was history. 300 people have your phone number and probably at points need counsel or need a conversation. Yes. What gives you the drive to maintain at the pace you're at? I think that, um, first of all, I've learned that not everyone's urgent is my urgent. I got that from Stephen Covey. Because in the early days of life coaching, I used to be on the phone like nonstop, like even late at night, two, three, four in the morning. I don't do that anymore. Because unless it's a major, major crisis, someone's been hospitalized or somebody had a, a relapse in the area of addiction, um, I, I make people make appointments and the biggest stars in the world, they gotta, they gotta go through my assistance. And I think it's better that way because I have to, I have to protect my own peace. I have to protect my own state of mind because I like to be in just a very sound mind. Uh, I like to be uh, steady in unsteady times. So um, even though they may have my number, doesn't mean they're urgent is my urgent. Sounds like really, you know, putting a lot of the practice that you probably you counsel on into your own life is helpful. Have you ever, you did life coach yourself? Yes, I have a therapist. I think that like this <laughs> and life- And it's not you? You don't do it for yourself? You no, somebody else? no, I need people. So I think that like to live the life that I get to live is so over my head. <laughs> like, how did this happen? Okay. So like sometimes I'm like driving down the street and I won't name drop on this one. And like someone will call me this like a huge gigantic movie star that we would look up to forever. And it just, it blows me away still. So I think that 
you know, for, for many, many years, I'm living this life that is different, better, more magical. And um, I like going to a therapist and just sitting there and making sure I stay on the yellow brick road, making sure that my motives are right, my mindset is, is right. Because in my kind of job, they, they offer you a lot of money to do different things like, uh, you know, mostly coming from just a, a lower income family to uh, starting to do real well, even in my early 20s. I just, I just wanted to be around practical mindsets that would keep me on the yellow brick road. And so far, so good. <laughs> you mean you bring up yellow brick road, you bring up magic. It feels like some of these kind of playful childlike qualities yes. are kind of key, key to your, would you say that's, that's actually is part of your work? That is so me. Uh, I got excited because Simon Cowell, who created um, X Factor and American Idol and uh, English Idol and all those other ones. Uh, I read one day that he likes to watch cartoons. So do I. I love animation. So every week of my life, I watch animated things. And every week of my life, uh, I really go back to the innocence of my childhood. I go back to Motown music, the Jackson 5, Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, because it clicks me back to little Timmy from Compton. So yeah, even though I've been on this journey for 61 years, uh, I have a very childlike spirit. But uh, I think that's important for me, for me. The minute I started playing basketball full time, everything just went by so fast, you can't even really comprehend it. You just go to the next practice, the next bus ride, the next game. Friends, you know, tell me, and we've been sitting here reflecting on it and talking about it, and they were always telling me, yeah, you were in the gym all the time, all day, every day. You worked at it, this is all you did. So, you know, to unpack those great stories, it's, uh, it's a good feeling to be able to look back on it and, and, and really be appreciative of it. And more importantly, tell those stories so that hopefully one day um, somebody can read it, take it for their own, and it will help them through a situation. If you want to be the best at something, you're going to find a way uh, uh, to push through those challenges and make sure you do what you need to do to be successful. You know, picking up the book, work ethic was one of the, the themes that just came through loud and clear. A lot of us wonder, what does that level of work ethic look like? You know, if you take yourself from a 17 year old going into the pros at a really young age, one year into university, mm -hmm. what does the work ethic look like all the way through? Take me into a practice. I was, uh, you want the pros or the college level? You know, we'll start at college level. Yeah, let's, we'll start at college level because, you know, that's always, that's a very good barometer. <laughs> you know, a typical day in college uh, for a student athlete, um, usually about two, three days a week, this would be one of the days. We'd get up at around 6 a.m. so we could lift weights at 6.30. Um, afterwards at around 7.45, 8 o'clock, um, we'll probably get some breakfast. We got class at 9, from about 9 to about 2.30. Then we had to walk uh, to practice. Some days you might have individual work, so you have to be there an hour early and get your work in. And then we practiced. Now, when we practiced, it was a solid three hours and 10 minutes. It was never, you know, that's about the average. Sometimes it'll go three and a half. Sometimes it'll be 2.50. But three hours and 10 minutes is, is the wheelhouse. Then um, around that time, we'd have to get dressed, of course, shower. And uh, it would be right at around 7 o'clock. We, we try to get to dinner by 6.30, 7, 7 o'clock. We get to dinner. We eat. And then we have a mandatory two hours of study hall afterwards. So, you know... I, didn't, I haven't said anything about being social. <laughs> it was just all work. And you know, that's not including the games. That's not including preparation uh, and meetings and treatment if you have to get treatment if you're hurt. You know, those were uh, uh, the requirements 
almost every day um, as a student athlete. And then, you know, I get to the pros. What was so crazy about the pros is it's kind of up to you, but the hours are already immense. So you have to take into effect that on a game day, usually people see your favorite, you know, you see your favorite player playing from 7.30 to 9.30, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right? Well, if we're playing a 7.30 game, I get up at 9.30, you know, so I can be at the gym at 10.30 so we can do our walkthrough in preparation for the game that night, which is about an hour. Then we have to get treatment again, get cover up those nicks and acts, shower. I'm out the gym by about 12 and I would take a nap, eat lunch, take a nap. Then I'm right back at the gym. And, you know, the, the true shock was after the game. If we have a back to back and we're playing a game in Charlotte the next night, well, right after the game, we're headed to the airport. We're flying into Charlotte. We're on the bus. Then we check into our hotel so we can be up for another seven o'clock game the next day. <laughs> so, you know, the pros, it was the the immense amount of games and that's 82 games a year. You know, it was uh, it was a traveling show. So you always had to be ready, have your bags packed, have your identification. In my case, my passport. And, you know, on top of practicing and lifting weights and appearances, uh, because it's a professional game now. So you have to do things for the season ticket holders. You know, just these requirements that you have to meet, it just, it, it became immense, but I eventually got used to it. When I picked up your book, one of the lines that caught me early on, you said, you know, there's a lot of people in your ear nowadays and all of them think they know, but I know what it takes. And then you start to get into these life lessons. Why was it so important to write this book and frame it for young people? Well, I, I wanted, we wanted to frame it for young people because of course, I think uh, we all consider ourselves, hopefully we all consider ourselves young. and. When you think of talking uh, to a younger person, you think more simply. The language, you're not trying to use too much advanced language to try to get your point across. It's simple, it's to the point, and it's to where people can understand it. And you know, that was pretty much the goal, uh, of course, of this book. And it helped me, uh, from a writing standpoint, kind of write to myself, almost, you know? Uh, because I see so much of myself in young athletes, you know, and I had some people along the way who helped me to tell me, I just want to see you do good. I don't want anything from you because in your quest for greatness, and especially if you want to be a professional athlete, people just want to take from you. You know, they'll see something good and they just want to take, take, take all the time for their own benefit. Or they'll be your friend for their own benefit. It's not to actually help you. This is to actually help people, you know, because I'm, I'm paying it back. This is my memento to the game because so many people um, throughout my process helped me. And I had a coach specifically tell me one time, I just want to see you do that. I don't want anything from you. I want to see what you can accomplish through hard work, through dedication, through commitment, through teamwork. And, you know, I just felt that through literature, this was such a great way to kind of give away those gems as well, because I've had so many books to help me, you know, that, that, that's where I, you know, I felt that, man, wow, I've taken in so much from reading books. I think this will work. And I think this will be there for people who are looking for something and looking to be inspired and looking just for that 1% to help them get just a little better, you know, a little bit closer to your goal. That's what I'm hoping uh, this will help people do. What do you think your edge is over everybody else? Right now or back when I was playing? <laughs> I, I think it's still around, but back when you were playing. <laughs> back when I was playing, yeah, it doesn't go anywhere, right? Um, yeah, back when I was playing, my edge was my intensity. My edge was my focus uh, and my commitment. You know, I put everything into the game. I prepared, um, I dreamt about it, I visualized it. I always prepared myself mentally for whatever is coming. 
And I felt that that was my edge. Just kind of like I was alluding to earlier, I read books. I felt that was an edge as well. You know, I've read these different books on mental toughness and I'm gonna take nuggets from each one to make and, and maybe it'll help me because I know I'm going into a tough situation and it's gonna be extremely hard but I'm not gonna give up and it doesn't even matter if the other side knows that about me they're in trouble before they even lace it up that's how I felt every single match I didn't care who I was playing and um, you know it kind of spills over into this day um, you know it's all about work ethic it's all about what you choose to do in life uh, what is important to you? W what is that goal that you're going to identify and go after and say, I'm going to go after this thing wholeheartedly. It doesn't matter what other people say. This is what I feel. It's positive. I love it. You know, the whole world disappears when I do it. And I'm going to channel this thing so I can help myself so I can help other people. I think, you know, uh, putting everything in the fine and that, that's kind of what I transfer it to. Uh, to now, but like now, I just try to, you know, do it with my work ethic. You know, be be responsible. Think about those things that I'm putting my time into, and what I want to accomplish while I'm doing these things. You know, I think that's uh, that's where I'm at now. But the passion, the purpose, um, you know, that never goes anywhere. What are some of those performance traits? Ask yourself questions. I had to really self-reflect and figure out what I was doing, and it was a, one of these fork in the road crises moments. And the next one is expand your perspective. It's incredible how we have selective awareness and we see what we want to see. Make a plan, like you have to write it down. Uh, act effectively, right? Hold yourself to account. Make sure you're aligning your actions to your goal. Go the distance. It's so easy to give up and so many people give up too soon. And then we have what we call the game changers. Be mm -hmm. innovative, right? That's that, be open to cr trying new things. Utilize power of thought to get your winning mindset. And my super trait, generate enthusiasm, build a support team and get people excited. And those were kind of the eight achiever traits that helped me lead myself to winning the Olympics. What do you think it takes to be the best? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the big question, but that's well, what I mean, it's really driving a lot of people. I and mean, that, that like, Right now it's not working and something's got to change, but that's the drive that's in me. Was there like a moment where that was awoken within you? Was that your lifetime working towards it? Like, what does it take or is it something else when you define it a different way? I don't know if the best is as important as your best. Mm. You know, mm. I think the best that's is- powerful. Yeah, I think that's great. I know it's cheesy, but like I did win, of course. It's easy to say, but I genuinely think had I been fifth, second, but I still felt like I really had done what I could do that day. I can live with that. I can live with somebody just being so talented that I will never have that talent. But if I let myself down and didn't do my best, that's really hard to live with. And that happened at my first Olympics. So that's why when I was in this situation and I didn't do anything about it, I saw a year before the Olympics, I needed to change things and I didn't. I did what most humans do. I just went through my routine. I tried to ignore it, just pretended it would be okay. And it wasn't, I, I sucked at the Olympics. I left so disappointed. A year out for the second time when I had that same kind of rock your boat situation, I was like, I have to do something. I have to live with the consequences for the rest of my life. So I was grateful that something kind of shook me up. But like I said, being the best was the goal, of course, but I think let's the, when you're focusing on your best, it's it's a little bit more manageable. Mm. I mean, I remember those games, 1992, watching this athlete burst onto the scene, gold medal in the backstroke. Can you describe Mark as the athlete? Sure, if you're American, you'd remember it too, <laughs> because I beat the American <laughs> last. That's right. <laughs> See, well, good news, that's right. right. That's right. right. Mexico, All of Canada's <laughs> just cheering right now. Um, so athletic Mark, I mean, I was a, a hard worker. I was a lot of energy. Um, I, I loved swimming because it kind of gave me an out. It let me see the world and it was um, meritocratic. You know, if you work hard, you can be recognized and rewarded for it. Um, but I just feel like I was part of a great team. I was part of an era of swimming that I saw the generation before me be world record holders and Olympic champions. And so it didn't seem that out of the ordinary that maybe I could do that too one day. Um, when the time actually came, it was pretty scary <laughs> because it's it's 
you know, it's something to be the very best in the world at what you do, even if it's just for a day. It's kind of, to go there is almost as scary as failing. And would you go into that fear? Like, I'm just curious, because I do think it would be scary standing out there. You've got to perform at your best on that day. What was that like? What were the emotions? Well, on the day itself, it was very calm and confident. But the lead up to it, I had to get work through a lot of stuff. You know, I think that we often hold ourselves back from being the best we can be with our thinking and we don't even know it. And so, like I said, I had to, um, to, to win the Olympics, I had to drop over a second and beat the world record holder that I'd never beaten in my whole life. So to think that, okay, on the most important day, I'm gonna, all these things are gonna happen. It was really almost fantastical. Like it was hard to be, like the first time I wrote down, I'm gonna swim this time, I laughed out loud because just, it seemed so unrealistic. But luckily I had a, I had a great swimming coach, Derek, but I also had a technical coach that was a synchronized swimming uh, coach, a woman. And she unlocked so much of my potential, including kind of my negative thinking, the stuff that might've been holding me back. So that by working through that, when I actually got to the day when it counted, um, I was just ready. Interestingly, at the Olympics, so in swimming, we have two races. I'm used to that. Now there's even more, there's three. We used to have a heat and a final. So if you make the final in the morning, there's eight hours until the evening. And there's, you can't do anything more physically except rest, but it's all up here. 